Why don't we begin? This is Fresh Hop Cinema. Hello and welcome to Fresh Hop Cinema, a craft beer and film podcast. This is episode 200, which I've got to say does feel like a milestone, something we haven't said in a while. It needs to be said now. Johnny Summers, we made it to 200. Yay, us. We haven't (laughs) even killed each other. You haven't broken up with me. I'm so stoked. Uh, Like I said, that's Johnny Summers. My name is Max Minardi. Every single week on the show, we talk about craft beer. We talk about movies. Most of the time, those things are brand spanking new. There's a good chance you haven't seen or drank those things, and we're coming at you with those fresh, fresh, hot takes. Um, We want to give you a couple little tidbits of information before we get rolling, uh, mostly where you can find us on the internet. And I will say, first and foremost, if you got a second, it's the Christmas season. Give us a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts. It really, 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 just for fun, one more, really helps people find the show. It looks really good when we have nice ratings. People people think that we know what we're talking about and they listen. Uh, Johnny, you want to give them social medias? Uh, Instagram and Twitter, at Fresh Hop Cinema. Find us, follow us, and love our stuff. Tell them about the light box. Or tell me more about the photo box, the light box, whatever you want to call it. I just got it in the mail. It's a sweet little light box that just pops up instantly, and it's got built-in LED lights. And I'm going to use it to take super sexual pictures of our beers for Instagram. This is concerning to me because I look at our Instagram, which is mostly curated by you, and I'm like, those are already some really sexy photos. So I'm excited to see what uh, your your eye and your hand and your light box crank out over the next uh, few weeks, man. Uh, <laughs> so I wanted to point out, if you're if you're not so much of a visual learner and you like reading words, find us on Letterboxd and Untapped. Those are uh, apps for movie reviews and ratings and beer reviews and ratings, and we're both at Fresh Hop Cinema, or you can search our names. Johnny Summers, what if they want to send us a good old-fashioned email? You can email us at fhccast, C-A-S-T, at gmail.com. That's fhccast at gmail.com. And here's the big one. If you've gone through that whole list, you're like, I've already done all that stuff, you guys. I need something bigger. I need something with more of an adrenaline rush. You can actually give us money. It's very easy to do, as it turns out. You go to patreon.com slash freshhopcinema, and you can give us a dollar or two dollars or three I don't think there's a limit per episode and we give you access to bonus episodes. A lot of the time we talk about some random hypotheticals that Johnny comes up with. Last week we put out an episode on the history of the India Pale Ale. We're also putting out a Christmas special and since this transition is just too juicy to miss, speaking of Patreon, if you're out there and you haven't had a chance to hear last week's bonus content, we wanted all of our patrons to send us a video as for the Christmas special. We need you to take that video. We need you to say the following. Good morning, sir. A Merry Christmas to you. We've gotten some submissions. Uh, just for fun, going to shout out some names. Nick Land, uh, Brandon Duran, Shelby Maturo. Thank you guys so much. The rest of you, please get those in um, as soon as you can. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, also, those submissions have let us know that Shelby is the real patron here. Why do you say Looking that? Looking at you, Trevor. Oh, Looking sure, at you. sure, sure. Yeah, Trevor, you, you at the very least, man. She's leading the charge. Step up to the plate, Honestly. my friend. Um, Johnny, production note that I didn't hit. I know we teased some uh, stuff from last week. Yes, so just some scheduling stuff has happened, and Christmas kind of came up quick and got overwhelming. We will not be covering Mank this week, as we promised. Simply not enough time in our lives. Believe it or not, we do other things besides this podcast. So we wanted to be really do our due diligence and fully absorb Citizen Kane in order to fully understand Mank. Yeah. Uh, As if you don't know, those movies are very intertwined and we'll get more into that when we cover it. But the fact is we didn't have enough time to do the classic film justice and squeeze both in. So we're actually putting that off and in a fitting turn of events, that's actually going to be our very first episode of the new year. It's going to be episode 201 coming out the first week in January. Johnny, do you happen to know what we'll be drinking that week? Uh, yes, actually, I do. We have it lined up. I was um, given some beers by the owner of Cedar Crest Brewing out of Red Bluff, and we are going to be covering two delicious beers from them, as well as, like I said, Mank and Citizen Kane. So keep your ears peeled for that first of the year. Okay, I think that's all the housekeeping. Uh, today, we're covering beers from Anderson Valley out of Boonville, and we're covering a film called Black Bear uh, by Lawrence Michael Levine. But before we get into film or beer talk specifically, Johnny, I know you're a you're sort of a longtime proponent of Anderson Valley. 
And I know that you've, you've picked out the beers this week and, and we'll get into some more information on uh, those in a second, but I wanted you to tell me a little bit about your history with this brew. When was the last time you were there? Uh, I actually got the beers for the show there last weekend. I popped into their their tap room. They had a really cool. Actually, helped the the lady that was setting up. I helped her set up her table for the day and drag it outside, and it was pretty cool. And uh, bought a six pack of their beers and shot the breeze with her for a little bit and hung out and actually had a couple of beers that I purchased uh, on the grounds. They like. You'll hear in the interview, they say they have a big, giant property, and you can kind of wander around. So I was there last weekend. I love that place so much. I actually come back from Fort Bragg uh, through Boonville and yeah. then over to Ukiah. So it's like a completely different way to get back to Chico. It takes about the same amount of time, and it's way less windy. And also, you can stop at Anderson Valley. So it's a, it's a multifaceted win if you're coming back or going to Fort Bragg. Yeah, the last time we covered them on the show was episode 123 back in May of 2019, and we did a beer called Frambois Rosé Gose, I believe is what we came to. Uh, we talked about it for a little bit here because when I hear like Frambois Rose Goza, but we went with Rosé Gose because it sounded more fun at the time. <laughs> we um, took it at Rosé Gose. Yeah, dude. And we both really liked it. It was You mentioned we we will play this interview in a minute here, but we got a chance to sit down and talk, or, or I did rather, with their brewmaster and their president and CEO. Um, and I sent them the old episode to prep for the interview. I was like, Hey, if you guys want to kind of check out the show and sort of the last time we, we talked about one of your beers, uh, here's the link. And I think I was going to do it no matter what, but I did want to go back and listen. Cause you don't necessarily want to send that link if we didn't like the beer and I right. can happily report that we very much did like that beer. I know Johnny, you're a big fan of their briny melon. I think we both really like their, um, their sort of the take on the Russian Imperial stout, huge Arker. Um, mm-hmm. So just just good things in general. I I think we're getting to that point where I'm going to play this interview, but I, they're just a couple of great guys. Again, Fal Allen's our brewmaster. He's been with Anderson Valley for about 15 years, and a fellow named Kevin McGee just took over as president and CEO back in December of 2019, um, which, as, as we talked about in the interview, is, is a hell of a time to sort of take ownership of a huge operation. Um, Johnny, any other prerequisites we should uh, talk about before, or should we just play this interview? Um, yeah, I actually did want to touch on one thing, and it's you. You did a great job with this interview. I had just barely enough time to squeak in listening to this, literally right before we recorded. And, and I got to say, I would love to hear you sit down and interview more people. This was an amazing job. It was really captivating, and you asked some really good questions, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Like I have to say, I was very impressed, so... Uh, my hat's off to you, sir. I wish I could have been there, but alas, my work schedule didn't let me. Um, but I got to say, you took the torch and ran with this in an absolutely awesome way. So uh, I'm going to say it once, maybe for the rest of the year. That's it. This is your last compliment, but you you killed this, man. Good job. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. Uh, so then I suppose without further ado, here is our conversation with Fal Allen, brewmaster of Anderson Valley, and Kevin McGee, the president and CEO. Enjoy. We'll be right back after this to talk about our first beer of the show. Well, shoot, guys. Uh, thanks for taking the time. I really appreciate it. I know it was kind of last minute, but I'm glad you guys were both available. Sure, no problem. Thanks for reaching out. Yeah, we uh, did. You guys happen to have a chance to uh, to listen to the link that I sent you from that previous episode that we'd done? Unfortunately, I didn't. I've been buried in distributor meetings for the last three weeks because it's the end of year, and they all want to talk about what happened this past year and what we're going to do next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah going around. Well, I, uh, I checked it out and I, cause I had, I didn't remember exactly what we said, but I listened through and we, I remember we were just both super, super stoked on it. Um, we sort of have a long history of, of, of enjoying your beers, which I feel like is maybe a, a common thing that I, I guess that you would get a lot. Um, but man, I, I'm really excited to drink these. We're drinking, um, uh, Funkin' Nuts and Tropical Hazy. It'll be next week's episode. So this will be sort of, uh, the interview we have ready, but I'm, I'm very excited to drink them. Um, but I wanted to get a, a couple of things, um, straight. I mean, are these pretty new beers, both of them? Relatively last, uh, year and a half or so. The tropical hazy we released in, uh, February, um, basically right before, uh, quarantine hit. So, um, we, uh, we had a whole bunch of things planned to do to kind of launch it, do some tastings and introduce people to it. And all of that got totally, um, torpedoed. Yeah. But at the meantime, it is absolutely on its own right um, taken off and it is on fire pretty much nationwide. We don't have a single market where it's not killing it. 
Yeah, I wonder if that speaks more to the sort of the mellow. Actually, well, since I haven't had it yet, I mean, stylistically, where do you think it leans most towards? Like, where does it get most of its inspiration from? I would imagine a goza, yeah? Sort of. I mean, the method we use is the same uh, method that we use for the goza, uh, but there's no coriander in it. It's much more heavily fruited than our other goza beers. Um, I, I would hesitate to call it a goza. Okay. Yeah, it's the, the, I mean, goza is one of the, the hallmarks of goza is they're a little bit um, salted. They have this, this salinity. And sure. uh, the the salinity level in, in the tropical hazy is, is far lower than our goza. But it is still a kettle sour. So it's in the kind of the same family, but it's a... It's a different animal. Yeah. So, Fal, I was going to ask you, how long have you actually been with Anderson Valley? Um, that depends on how you slice it up. About 15, <laughs> 16 years. Yeah, I wanted to jump back to, I think, what is it, 1990, you, uh, you started up with Pike Brewing. Is that right? Yeah, I started brewing at Pike in either 89 or 90. Yeah, I mean, and that was a time where, I mean, even IPA was kind of a, a, a not a super household name for brewery styles. I feel like you were probably on the forefront of pushing that. Yeah. You know, when I started at Pike, I don't, we didn't know anybody that made an IPA. Yeah. The first IPA I had was from the big time brewery and it was in kind of an unheard of style. Um, I'd been brewing for a couple of years when I went to Pike, I worked at Red Hook before that. Uh, we had to do a lot of research at Pike when we first made our IPA and um, by, by, by the newspaper's reports anyway we did a pretty good <laughs> job of it people seem to like it and i think they're still making a pretty similar recipe to uh that that we you know we first made i think they're still making pretty much the same recipe or similar similar so i, I also wanted to touch base i mean a little bit of, of history on on anderson valley i mean it's you guys have been around since 1987 i believe yeah yep. yeah i was just having a conversation with with johnny my co-host on on this week's episode and we were talking about sort of um you know, kind of the big names in craft beer when it first started. And we were particularly talking about the history of IPAs and in my brain, and maybe it's just because we're here in Chico, but I, I mean, Sierra Nevada has been around for forever. And I thought specifically their torpedo IPA had also been around basically since day one, but it's only about 11 years old, that beer. Yeah, that was, that was a spinoff of uh, um, when people were kind of making Randall's in their, in their garages and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and uh, Sierra had the brilliant idea of, of scaling it up to like commercial size, um, but yeah, that was uh, yeah that would have been about eleven years ago, I think. Yeah, uh, Kevin, I was going to say I know you've only been um, uh, president and CEO of Anderson Valley since uh, last December, but you've had sort of a long history with beer. I was hoping you could tell me uh, if I could go for a little deep cut here um, about the Healdsburg Beer Company. Uh, sure. Um, I was, I was working as a wine executive, um, as kind of the, the, that was basically a personal business strategist and, and lawyer to Jess Jackson, the Jackson family wines. And, uh, while I was there, um, first of all, I was trying to make wine and I'm the world's worst winemaker. And I dumped yet another <laughs> batch of, uh, of horrible wine down the toilet. And my wife, uh, said you should try and make beers like my, my brothers <laughs> made beer and it, it turned out okay and yeah so um so i gave it a shot and, and actually really liked the process i, I had uh, a good result first time out which helps and the other thing that i liked was that i could brew and ferment and then taste um pretty quickly so i could iterate my learning curve and attention span mm. um, could be aligned a lot more closely than what i was doing with wine and then, uh, so while um, working with Jess, I would go to these holiday parties and I would see these winemakers kind of in little, you know, conversation clusters and, you know, you know kind of counting the, you know, 98, 99, 100 point wines between maybe like four or five of them and realizing that they're all drinking like Modelo or yeah. Coors Light and that kind of thing. And, I'm, and I thought, to, and I had a light bulb moment. I'm like, you know what, if I just made decent beer, I could trade it for really good wine. For great wine, sure. And uh, and that plan totally worked. Um, but uh, in, in the meantime, my wife made the mistake of actually encouraging me to to follow up on some of my instincts, and so so I uh, uh, ended up figuring out how to license and bond my garage in a residential neighborhood in in Healdsburg, 
so I, I became one of the first, I think, like one of the first two or three um, nano brewers um, in the country um, before that was even kind of a term. And unlike yeah. all of the others who moved on and actually did something with their lives, I continued, <laughs> I continued running a one barrel brew house until uh, last December, really. I mean, when, when um, my family bought Anderson. So I'd been running a one barrel brew house, making 30 gallons of cask ale, one batch at a time, uh, selling kegs out of the front seat of my Subaru Yeah, for 13 years. Yeah, I mean, I was curious, what inspired, uh, had you been looking to to get into a larger brewing situation and Anderson Valley just kind of came across your desk or, or what, what inspired that in the first place? Um, answer your first question is absolutely. I mean, pretty much from from very early on in the Healdsburg Beer Company days, you couldn't you couldn't do it and realize you know, you're slogging. I mean, it was ridiculously labor intensive. And if I had to pay myself or pay rent, it just wouldn't make sense. But I, I was mm-hmm. one of the so there isn't isn't any way to not think there's got to be an easier way to do this and and, and really easier way is kind of scale. Um, so I always thought about you know maybe um, um, doing something bigger, but really one of the the real learning moments was um, I had you know one foot in the beer community and one foot in wine, and um, also a little bit in some consumer products, doing uh, a lot of high end high level sort of business um, stuff when the recession hit. Uh, back in you know 2009 and 10, and I saw the the tools that were available to a brewery to navigate sort of times of crisis that were not available to a lot of other places, and uh, that coupled with the fact that I was um, really kind of I was embraced by a lot of people who really had no no reason to be you know kind of as generous or gentle. Um, mm generous with their time or gentle with my ignorance, uh, you know, in the craft beer industry and just the people that I met and got to know in the whole community was just outstanding. And, uh, was just something that it was, you know, if, if I could find a way to be a legitimate part of that, I was going to try and do that. And then, you know, 10 years, you know, down the road, I was doing some, uh, you know, consulting work for, um, some different breweries and doing mergers and acquisitions work in, in wine and spirits and beer and, some uh, uh, you know, just business consulting and operating partner type stuff. And we, uh, um, my dad and I, had uh, you know had a continuing conversation about the idea that it'd be fun to to get involved in a family business. And I've got three other siblings too that um, yeah. also would be into it. Uh, so about two years ago, we um, uh, we decided to put some some energy behind it and go and start looking. And so we looked probably at. Looked maybe about 15 breweries, took a very close look at um, about, about five and did a deep dive into two. One of them was Anderson. Uh, mm-hmm. Anderson Anderson worked out, um, really had all the things we were looking for. It had a lot of deep authenticity. The beer quality was absolutely um, top notch. And uh, it, it, it just had all of the, the pieces that you need um, to make it go, of, you know, you know, being a really good brewery, and the things that needed to be, you know, addressed were mostly kind of self-inflicted. I mean, the brewery wasn't really doing much communications or marketing and that kind of stuff. And so, you know, being in a position where, you know, I I'm just kind of reintroducing people to sort of the spirit of the brewery rather than you know apologizing for some sort of, you know, exploding slushy, you know, 16 ounce can episode or whatever um, makes is a lot easier. Because the 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 beer quality is really the hard part. I mean, everything else sure. you, know, you can kind of fix, you know, a much shorter timeline. But if you don't have good beer, you're kind of dead in the water. And and Anderson's beer, you know, to me was always you know up there with the the finest producers you could find. So it was uh, it was a great opportunity to get involved. And it's only an hour away from my house too, which is another bonus. So I was familiar with the brewery, and and uh, I'm up here every day. I'm not traveling too, so it's great to just kind of be here. Yeah, I'm I'm curious. I mean, obviously December 2019 knowing that 2020 is on the horizon is um a, a difficult thing to to go into and I'm sure plans change a lot and I'm sure they have. I'd be curious to know how for both of you that's uh, changed your experience. Fal obviously you've been there longer. Um and I'm wondering what sort of um I don't know if it would necessarily change your approach to brewing, um but certainly maybe quantities and styles have have you actively changed sort of the approach because of COVID this year? Not, not from a brewing perspective. Um, 
certainly part of any good brewer is to get out into the market and see what's out there and see what other people are doing. Um, and I haven't done that this past <laughs> year much. So yeah. I, I'm missing the interaction with other brewers and the, you know, the, the conversations and discussion, uh, the camaraderie certainly. Uh, but other than that, I think, you know, we, we've just kind of put our heads down and focused on making really good beers. We've, we've made a couple new beers. Um, but you know, it, it's hard to have a, a big release uh, during, during the time of COVID when people aren't out in bars or restaurants. So we've been pretty limited. Our releases of these new beers have been smaller and um, I like to think they're good beers, uh, but you know, they're just not getting out to as many people. Yeah, it's trickier. I've noticed a lot of breweries, which reminds me, uh, your guys' website is just wonderful. So often on the show, we'll look up something, we'll try to find information on a particular beer or an older beer, and, and it looks like it was drafted in the early 2000s. And yours is so well put together, and a lot of breweries have shifted towards sort of you know, uh, shipping beers and ordering online. Are you guys doing any of that? I'm mostly asking because uh, if listeners want to get a hold of beers that aren't maybe in their local bottle shops, are they able to do that? You know, we're, we're not doing brewery direct sales. Um, I mean, where our tap room is open, if you can get up here, uh, there's fulfillment. Actually, and if you go to like Drizzly, Drizzly, um, I believe sources from, you know, local bottle shops and stuff. So it's still, sure. uh, you know, kind of supporting some of your local, local, you know, folks. And uh, we have a lot of items uh, in uh, uh, Whole Foods and, and because of that. Some of our stuff is available to Amazon, but we we made the decision not to do sort of brewery direct sales because uh, the the retailers around us and um, our distributors uh, they they've all got employees and and families to support and businesses to support too, and we need them to stay healthy and be uh, you know be able to kind of get through all this as well. So um, we'll still I mean we'll stock their shelves. We're we're fine with that. Um, we're happy with our place in that supply chain, but we would, we'd rather encourage people to go, you know, to their local bottle shop, support a local business than, than try and ship them a case of beer. Yeah, that does. You've, you've touched on it a little bit, but it's sort of this idea of the camaraderie in, in the craft beer community and everything from, yeah, wanting to encourage people to support local and um, maybe being forgiving of people that are just getting into it. Uh, I feel like that's just been the case. And and I mean, I like wine as well. I'm not obviously as plugged into the wine community, but there does seem to be a, some distinguishment between the two attitudes. Like it just seems less competitive in beer. Absolutely. I mean, I often use the example, if the guys down in Para Public run out of something or need something, they give us a call. And if we got it, we give it to them and vice versa. And you would just never find, you know, any other two groups, you know, going to call each other. Chevy is not going to call Ford. If yeah. Run out of yeah. It's a, you know, Macintosh isn't going to call up Bill Gates, you know, and the, it, it just doesn't happen in other communities as much, uh, if at all. Yeah. In the brewing community, we're really a tight group and we really have been supportive of each other, particularly the craft brewers. Um, and it's just, it's a real nice community, nice folks. Yeah, I wanted to get at this point as well. So over the years, it seems like this, your guys, Anderson Valley has clearly embraced this idea of incorporating bootling into your branding, particularly when it comes to naming beers. And I imagine most people don't maybe give it a second thought when they read Hop Otten. But when I see that, I, I get curious and I was hoping you guys could explain to people exactly what bootling is and maybe some of your favorite words or phrases that haven't necessarily made it onto a can or a bottle, but still kind of exist around the brewery in the town. Well, you know, Bootling's been around since the 1880s, and it's uh, there's three, um, three. What do they call them? Uh, not language. Is it three language? languages? You know that are uh, colloquial. You know, specific to certain points. There's Hawaiian Pidgin English. There's Cajun, and there's Bootling, and hmm. those three are recognized as three American lingos, and. Uh, Boonling's a real thing. A lot of people think we made it up, but it, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's not made up by us. It's a real thing. You can, you can buy the dictionary and go to bookfinders.com and type in Boonling Dictionary. Um, but we tried to keep the language alive. You know, it's been dying out for quite a few years. And by naming some of the beers in Boonling, we tried to keep the language alive. And there's it's some in our marketing and, you know, in no other brewery in the world has their own language. Yeah, sure. 
we tried to promote it some, but I think sometimes it's a little confusing for folks. Hop Otten seems to work <laughs> well. We have a beer called Huge Arker, uh, sure. which is Boneling. Uh, and a lot of Boneling is words that they're, they're not really made for polite company. You know, the language <laughs> was developed to talk about outsiders in front of them. Which yeah. Is a really nice thing anyway. And so a lot of it's, you can't really put on a beer label without getting into to too much trouble. We, we made a beer a few years ago and it was a draft only beer. We didn't want to, you know, get a full label for it. And we named it Nettied Madge, which means a, a gussied up prostitute. Right. Thank you. And, <laughs> I, 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 go ahead. You know, we didn't think anything of it. It was just kind of, you know, funny and it yeah. was, you know, words that came out of the Boneling Dictionary, but we took a lot of heat for it, you know, from some sectors. And so we realized that we got to be a little more careful um, with some of the names and we can't, you know, we can't, you know, name things that are really going to offend people. So you got to be careful. So then not to put you on the spot, but but what does huge arker mean? Well, an arker is uh, an event of, you know, catastrophic proportions. Like a, mm-hmm. a, a huge arker would be like a nuclear bomb and a Moshe arker would be like a car wreck. You know, so it's a, it's, the huge arker is like a, 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 an explosion. And our, in our mind, it's like a huge explosion of flavor. Sure. I mean, it's a, it's a huge beer. I think that should be noted. If people haven't had it, it's, it's comes in around 15% or 14 or 15, if I'm not mistaken. Just over 15, 15, five. Yeah. I actually did the yeah. research. It's illegal in seven States. Is it? Which I thought was hilarious. We had one of our, one of our distributors <laughs> from the East coast. Um, when we, uh, when we updated the, uh, the ABV, um, called us back and said, is this really, Fifteen and a half percent alcohol, and I said, "Yeah." I said, "We can't yeah. sell it," and I'm like, "That's the best news I've heard all day." So I picked up, uh, <laughs> I got got to my computer and started researching uh, different things, and found that it was illegal in seven states. So we've been actually leading with that. With some of our that's money. a that's a great tagline. Yeah, of course you would. That's lovely. Yeah, call your legislator. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I was looking in the Bootling, and there, there is, I, I would guess, maybe a sort of fractured dictionary on Wikipedia. And I kind of expected to see like 20, 30 words, but there's, there's gotta be, I mean, at least like 200 here. And, and you pointed that out. It's not necessarily dinner language. There's all sorts of things that you don't, you could never sound out. Like in a lot of languages, you can kind of derive it from maybe Latin or a different language. And these are all almost nonsense sounding. And the fact that people have learned these is, is uh, fascinating and, and wonderful to me. It's, a lot of Boonling is related to things and people in Boonville. So it, it was so unique that they used it as a code language during World War I, like they used Navajo during World War II. Yeah, sure. It's so unique that, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to understand it. So, for example, the word for a doctor is a shovel tooth. And you think, <laughs> Shovel tooth. Why isn't that the the word for dentist, maybe, or something? Sure. There's there's no rhyme or reason, but the reason it's called a shovel tooth is because the very first doctor in Anderson Valley had these pair of front teeth, you know, (laughs) that look like shovels. (laughs) So you're not from here. You're never going to know that story. Right. My my wife bought me a a book from, it, it was published in 1971. Um, that's Bootling in American Lingo. Uh, which I think is the definitive uh, uh, book on bootling. And it has a 103-page dictionary at the back uh, for all the different words and stuff. And, wow. and, and, and I have it, and it's on my desk so that I can figure out what people are saying about me in case it ever comes <laughs> up. Yeah, as you should. But it looks like, I mean, like all of the, I mean, basically bootling is a systematized inside joke, really. I mean, it's like, it's. I mean, a lot of the, the stuff like the names for dogs and references to dogs are named actually after dogs that used to live in Boonville. Yeah. Um, and what's the name for, what's the public phone foul? Do you remember? Bucky it's a Bucky Walter. And yeah. the reason it's called a Bucky Walter was because uh, a Bucky, what well, used to be their term for an, a nickel, you know, there was an Indian's head on the nickel and then they called that a, a, you know, an Indian buck or a Bucky and Walter was the first guy in the valley to own a phone. 
So he got, you know, the distinction of the phone was called a Walter. So a Bucky Walter is a nickel phone or a pay phone. <laughs> just, I feel like there are some breweries that even if they have been around in their, their you know, small towns for forever, not all of them necessarily embrace the culture of the area. And I'm really grateful. I mean, uh, we obviously have um, Sierra Nevada here, but even Secret Trail, uh, I don't know if it's made its way down to you guys ever, but they're a relatively new brewery. I think they sprung up in about 2017. Um, and are just all about embracing sort of Bidwell Park, which is a big park we have here, a lot of outdoor enthusiasts. And uh, it really makes a brewery feel like part of a town as opposed to something that is sort of looming over it and making money from the people that live there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's hard. I mean, the brewery here is in its current place um, since, uh, I think, 1996. Mm-hmm. And uh, we have 30 acres here. And actually, we just were able to change the licensing. So I've, I've, uh, I've licensed the entire 30 acres. So we are a 30 acre beer park. Um, yeah. So we, we took, we took the license for the tap room and worked with the ABC for the last six months to move the perimeter of that license out to the fence line. What are you going to do with all the extra real estate? Oh, we have a, we have an 18 hole disc golf course and we are putting hmm. in, uh, we got some plans. We're going to landscape a little bit. We're putting in about a eight to 10,000 square foot lawn for people to kind of hang out on and lounge on. And, uh, some plans for uh, just putting in like vignette seating and things and just allow people to kind of get out, hang out and, uh, you know, well, in, in this day and age, socially distance. Yeah, sure. Uh, and uh, just kind of enjoy being outside. And it's like basically take, you know, everything that you like about beer gardens and put it on 30 acres. Yeah, it sounds great. But it's a, but it's a, it's a chunk of the property in a very small town too. And the, the brewery has been here you know, for, for such a long time that it's, it's just always kind of been a fixture and, you know, and it's here because, you know, this was, this was a good place for it at the time and the town grew up around it. It it grew up, you know, with the town too. And so they're, they're kind of intertwined and, you know, coming in as a new owner. I mean, that's one of the last things that you really want to separate. I mean, the identity and the spirit and soul of the place is a real, you know, important thing. And, uh, and visiting here is is an important way to kind of experience it too. So um, we, we're all about you know Boonville and, and Anderson Valley and the whole area. Yeah, taking it back kind of to the original days. I know it was founded by David Norfleet and Kim and Ken Allen. I did check file. I know that you're not related to them, but it was a strange coincidence. Um, and maybe you guys could correct me, but I I think I read an article saying that David Norfleet just passed away uh, a couple months ago. Yeah, uh, about a month ago, not even a, a month, month ago. ago. Yeah, um, it's very sad. He was, he was the the guy who put the brewery together. He was the guy who uh, he didn't have the technical know how. He went out and found it. Uh, he, you know, certainly engineered a lot of it. He helped build the building we're sitting in. Um, the very first time I poured cement was for our pub across the the parking lot and. He oversaw that and yelled at me a lot because I didn't know what I was doing. He yeah. was just a, a real character, a really great guy. And he continued to help the brewery even after he wasn't part of it uh, up until, you know, this year. So we'll, we miss him a lot. Yeah, he was yeah. He was still a regular here. Um, but I was happy I was able to get to know him over the last year. Yeah, there was, a, there was an interview that he did years back that got republished, which is how I heard about it. And he just... Seems like he led a terrifically exciting life and and kind of took everything head on and and just went for it. Absolutely, he came in uh, about three or four weeks before he passed, and he'd gotten the news from his doctor that you know he was on limited time, and he came in and said, "Hey, how you doing?" And he said, "Well, my rent's due. Time to pay the rent." You know, and I said, <laughs> "Man, I'm really sorry to hear that because he." been having some health problems this past year yeah. and he said no nah, you know i had a really good life things went well it happens it's part of the process so he wasn't sad he wasn't scared he wasn't he's just a real down-to-earth guy you know and you don't find a lot of people like that anymore yeah certainly somebody to emulate it sounds like um, well, before I get, uh, too far off track, I did want to ask you guys a couple more things, uh, specifically about the two beers that we're going to be drinking, Funkin' Nuts IPA and Tropical Hazy Sour Ale, um, mostly just kind of what to expect, maybe some inspirational stuff on, on why you chose what you chose to make them and uh, anything else that I might not have been able to Google myself would, uh, would be greatly appreciated. 
Which one do you want to start with? Let's start with what we will probably do first on the show. So we'll say the Hazy Sour. The Tropical Hazy Sour uh, was a major group effort by a lot of different people, some of them who don't even work here. Um, a guy named Greg Knox, who I believe still works at Maui Brewing um, over on Maui, and yep. had a lot to do with it. And we, you know, we'd wanted to make a beer using the brew house souring method that wasn't a goza. We wanted to kind of, you know, we'd made a lot of gozas and uh, we're certainly going to make some more, but we wanted to do something else along those lines that wasn't a goza, that wasn't labeled as a goza, didn't taste like a goza. And so we experimented with a lot of different kind of flavors because, uh, you know, a sour beer lends itself to some, some fruit in there, definitely. Um, you've certainly seen that out in the market lately. And we just didn't know what to do. And so we tried a bunch of different things. And I grew up in Hawaii and they have a drink there called Pog, which is passion orange and guava. Mm. And we tried that and it didn't really quite work for us. And then, you know, we all decided that kind of it was the orange that was pulling things away. So we came up with just using the guava and the passion fruit and pulled out the orange and made a few other changes. And when we brewed it, it was just you know, we all thought it was delicious. It was super thirst quenching, really good fruit flavor, and, you know, a little bit of sour, not overpowering. So we kind of went with it. Yeah, I, I think there's something to be said for sort of some subtlety and some nuance. It, it, there's, um, and this is actually a personal critique, and my co-host doesn't feel the same. He loves the briny melon, but for me, it's 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 very, it's too watermelony for my own palate, but something with a little a little bit more of a subtle thing is is right up my alley. So I'm very excited to try this one. Yeah, I think the, the fruit really works well together uh, along with the sourness. And, you know, at the time, hazy IPAs were the craze. And we had decided we weren't going to make a hazy IPA because they just, they don't travel well. Yeah. Majority of our sales are not in Boonville. They're, they're out in the world. And sure. we didn't want to make a beer that wasn't going to get to our consumers tasting great. So we found that the fruit, the pectin in the fruit, caused a lot of haze in that beer. And when it came time to clarify it, somebody said, why? Why yeah. would we do that? <laughs> Just going to pull out some flavor and no one cares anymore. Right, right. Put hazy on the can and it, it's bulletproof when it comes to, you know, traveling and shelf life because uh, the fruit is all fermented, you know, fully fermented out. So we just left it hazy. We we don't, you know, we spin half the beer so we get some clarification and then blend it back with the other's unspun half and it, it, I think it, it adds to the, adds certainly to the mouthfeel of the beer and having the word hazy on the can doesn't hurt. I don't think. I guess not. No, I suppose not. You, I mean, you mentioned it's been doing well. You said you started in February. Um, it, it seems like on paper, you'd expect a beer like this to maybe fall off as the colder months kind of set in, but it sounds like maybe it's been just consistently loved. Yeah, it's been, it's been, um, broadly embraced uh yeah. it's it's almost like um well i mean it's, it's first of all it's a really really balanced beer uh it's you know it's easy to drink it's got um you know kind of that that kettle sour sort of tartness almost like you know lemonade um but the the fruit kind of comes through you know really clearly and and, and sets it off too so it's it just it hits a really good spot and is really well balanced and so it's uh pretty drinkable for um you know almost any occasion the other thing that we're finding is that a lot of people that like um Sauvignon Blanc and and some of those you know wine like flavors and white wine drinkers um, yeah it, it reaches that that kind of need to um so it's really versatile it's actually really pretty versatile with food surprisingly um and just a great you know kind of you know casual beverage uh, it's just a really good beverage. So uh, that's been the tough thing. I mean, this year, not being able to do, you know, in-person tastings and and really launch the, the beer like we wanted to, um, really just, just the power of what the thing tastes like has been driving it like crazy. And we're, we're happy that, you know, it, it got into enough people's hands that we were able to, to you know, kind of have it introduce itself. But it's just, I mean, it's just a delicious beverage. 
Yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait to try it. Which brings us to uh, Funkin' Nuts. So maybe same series of questions. Love to know uh, maybe why the particular hops and sort of just inspiration in general. The Funkin' Nuts started its life as a different beer, um, which had a Boatling name, which we didn't think, again, we didn't think anything was wrong with this <laughs> name. Uh, but it, it turns out that it's the, the, the Rebel Yell. We called the beer Ita, and apparently that's what rebels yelled uh, in the Civil War on their way to, you know, to make carnage. And oh, yeah. Took a little bit of heat for that, too. Sure, and sure. That was kind of unexpected. So we didn't reformulate the liquid because we, we really liked that beer. And we had a kind of a contest around the brewery. And one of our guys came up with a, the name Funkin' Nuts. And that stuck. And the beer itself, I think, is kind of our interpretation of some of those really juicy IPAs that were coming out a few years back. We really kind of liked that idea, but we didn't want to go too hazy. We didn't want to get, make it a hazy IPA again for obvious reasons we talked about. Yeah. So we tried to make a beer that was really juicy and really hop forward in flavor and aroma, but a little bit milder in bitterness than your standard IPA. And when we went to clarify it, you know, we have a centrifuge, so we're able to, to dial the clarity in. And yeah. We'd leave a little bit in there, uh, which is going to bring a little more flavor to it, but it probably isn't going to be a, a problem out in the market. It's not going to drop bite real quick and leave a thick layer of sludge on the bottom, and it won't you know, yeah. lead to problems with oxidation. So it was kind of just our stab at making a juicy IPA. Yeah, it's it's interesting, sort of the way that the pendulum has swung. We covered uh, we covered monkish brewing on the show a week or two ago which has sort of picked up a cult following for being sort of the juiciest West Coast New England IPAs you can find. And Johnny was saying that, I mean, he's been saying it for a while now that he's just sort of burnt out on it because partially so often that style can just be overdone almost as an excuse for masking things that aren't that interesting in a beer. Uh, so anytime something like Funkin' Nuts will come across our desk, he gets so excited. Um, and, and I do too. I'm I'm also very, very much... Uh, you know, less enthusiastic about maybe your traditional sort of juice bomb New England IPAs than I was a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, the main thing we try to do when we make beers here is make interesting beers, you know, beers with character, but we want you to have a second one in whatever glass size it comes in. And so we don't want to make a beer that is a punch in the face. We want to make a beer with panache, that you know has enough subtlety and enough drinkability that even a big beer like the huge arker you finish it and you're thinking <laughs> i want to have a little more and you we've all had these beers where you have two ounces of it and you think well that was really cool but yeah yeah i'm done at two ounces and that doesn't do the brewery any favors we're not selling a, you know, who wants to drink two ounces of beer? You know, if you're selling beer out in the pubs, it doesn't do them any favors. They don't want a beer yep. that people can order one of and then, you know, leave. Yeah. So we try to make beers that are really quaffable, really sessionable, even, even the bigger beers. We want people to come back to them. Yeah, fair enough. Well, I had uh, I have one parting question for you guys, unless there's anything else that uh, you have that I have not asked that you think I should know. We're into beer-flavored beers. Um, Perfect. You know, if it if it, uh, uh, if it kind of comes across like it's you know a little bit more of kind of a fashionable sort of hype, sort of shiny object type of thing, we're we're probably not doing that. Um, you know, and that's you know part of it is I think there's there's you know cycles and people get you know tired of being kind of stunt junkies you know for uh, you know what seems to be a good idea at the time. Um, we make really good beer flavored beers and frankly, it's harder to make good beer flavored beers yeah, than it is yeah, to, to do, do some other stuff. There's huge margins of error in the process of making some of this other stuff. I mean, among them is that you don't have any expectations to meet because it's all new. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's kind of, you know, where we're at and where we're going from and, uh, yeah, beer flavored beers. Yeah. Fair. Then in the spirit of us being a both movie and beer podcast, I would like to ask you both, and this doesn't have to go on your tombstone or anything, but if you had to say your favorite film, 
I would love to know what that is. Maybe maybe your top two if you can't decide on one. Uh, I think I'll throw it to Kevin first. Ooh, I would think that, and it kind of changes with um, sure. whether I want to make my daughter and my wife happy about my pick. <laughs> um, yeah. But I would say right now I am probably feeling Rogue One. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm kind of a that- total, uh, I'm a, a bit of a Star Wars nerd. I actually have a... Uh, a Boba Fett action figure in my office that I use as the get to work Mandalorian. So that when my, uh, when my, my attention span kind of wanders and I start looking around the room, he's set up to make eye contact with me. And it's like, he's saying, get to work. So get back at it. Yeah. I have a get to work Mandalorian. So, uh, yeah. So I would go probably rogue one. I like that movie a lot. That got a lot of, that got a lot of, I actually also really liked rogue one, but I heard from a lot of people like it was inconsequential and it didn't matter. And, I just thought it was so well done as well. That, that's uh, very nice to hear. I'm not a huge Star Wars nerd or anything, but uh, I thought that movie was great. Uh, Fal, what you got? Yeah, I, I I can't answer. It's it, it's too <laughs> it's, much. It's a big one. It's okay. a big question. I, I have to say, I, I can pick two genres. How about? I'll take it. Um, so I'm a big fan of film noir. Okay. They, you know, there's some channel TCM or something that has a noir alley every saturday night and that mm-hmm. that's how i spend my saturday nights usually or at least i tape them and watch them later uh you know and so the obvious film noir answer would be like casablanca but everybody loves casablanca um, <laughs> i'm for good reason though yeah well uh i think really my favorite bogey movie would be in a lonely place uh oh, which okay speaks to me in a whole bunch of different ways with uh, gloria graham uh directed by her uh her husband, Nicholas Ray, uh, great movie, probably Bogey's best performance, certainly one of her best. Uh, you can feel the madness in the movie, the craziness, um, that and anything that Klaus Kinski does. So, uh, yeah, I actually, I had my first, not my first, but sort of my first real intentional dip into noir with the Maltese Falcon, maybe not even a year ago. Uh, it had kind of been on my list. It's a genre that I don't know all that well. Um, certainly more familiar with neo-noir stuff particularly like in the sci-fi vein. Um, but I, I was, yeah, Bogart was great. Um, I'm certainly interested in learning more about it. We're actually covering, uh, on, on this episode, the film that we're doing is uh, Mank, which is new to Netflix. It's uh, David Fincher, and we're going to also be kind of doubling up with Citizen Kane. Ooh, Citizen uh, Kane. And as you know, there's going to be some overlap, certainly with discussions of film noir in that thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, the thing about the Maltese Falcon, at least when I first watched it, I was I was in my teens when I first saw it, and I kept thinking, Ah, oh, this is so cliche. This is so <laughs> cliche. But then you realize this is the this is this the is the, this is the template. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just you know, it's stunning. Um, yeah. yeah. Orson Welles did some good uh, film noir stuff too. I think my only exposure to him that I can think of is probably Citizen Kane, off the top of my head. I mean, I'm wrong. Yeah. Uh, he's done some great ones. I think Touch of Evil was it was either mm. Touch of Evil or no, I think yeah, the one he did is just. With Marlena Dietrich, it's fantastic. Yeah, that guy was a guy was a wonder. Put out Citizen Kane when he was twenty five years old. Yeah, huh. and as he got older, he just <laughs> wasn't afraid to show his 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 huge obesity. I mean, he became yeah. enormous. Or the Third know. Man is also a good one of his. Sure, I didn't. I man, I would have peppered in more film talk if I had known you guys were into movies as much. I could talk about movies all day. <laughs> well, on that note, let's uh, let's do it again sometime. I really appreciate you guys taking the time. It means a lot. Absolutely, please. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. We'll uh, we'll we'll talk to you both soon. All right. Cheers. All right, Max. Right. Take care, fellas. Take care. Want to say thanks one more time to Fal and Kevin. I really appreciate you guys sitting down. Uh, it was sort of a last minute thing, and I'm I'm glad it worked out. I enjoyed talking beer, obviously, and a little bit of film there with you right at the end. Johnny Summers, but my lord, my mouth is parched, and all of that talk about their tropical hazy sour ale has left me quite thirsty. So why don't you tell me some stuff about this beer? Uh, maybe just the description from their website. Yeah, get your get your beer open, man. Get to pouring and get to drinking. I got some talking to do. Uh, also, but in follow up with that interview, how awesome are those guys? And how <laughs> hard is it to not be a massive fan of their brewery after hearing them talk about it? Just their origins and how I they know. got into it. I like know. it's such a genuine and true story. And I loved hearing him talk about the camaraderie and the the brotherhood or, you know, familyhood, let's say, because it's a very sure. female-involved in, industry as well these days uh, of craft beer and yeah. how we wanted to be a part of that. It was super inspirational. So I really enjoyed listening to that. I was a huge fan of this brewery before. I love going there, and I love 
their beers. Uh, but hearing that interview, it's really hard to not root for these guys and support their beer going forward. So super happy they're on the show today. And also a huge thank you to them for for doing that. Not a lot of breweries and presidents of breweries take the time for stuff like that. Agreed. For our podcast. So I am super appreciative to them for doing that. Now, let's get to the fun part where we get to drink their stuff and shit all over it. Just kidding, guys. I'm sure it's going to be great. Uh, The first beer we're doing is Tropical Hazy Sour Ale. It is a kettle soured, hazy, sour ale, just like it said. ABV is 4.3% from their website. Springtime in Anderson Valley is a magical and transformative time. As the days start getting longer and the sun starts shining warmer, we look for a beverage to pair with the weather and this place. We wanted something with a lot of flavor and character, but still light and refreshing, so we could enjoy our time being active outside with friends. The Tropical Hazy Sour is the beer we dreamed of for this. Dreamed up for this. So I actually made a correction. I found, this is before the interview, uh, but I found online that it was actually, it was 4.3, but this particular batch is 4.2%, obviously not a, uh, an affecting difference necessarily. Um, and I also wanted to point out, I remember Faust saying in the interview that there wasn't coriander in this because I asked him if this would be stylistically comparable to a Goza. He said, typically those have coriander. I just wanted to ask Fal if you happen to be listening, let us know because the can does say coriander. And lest my palate deceive me, I almost would say that I almost pick up on it. But certainly my first impression of this beer is sort of the lightness and the guava is the thing that jumps out most. Have you tried it? Yeah, I've, I think I've drank almost half of it. It's really good. <laughs> uh, first of all, I'm kind of thirsty and this is my first beer of the day. So yeah. it automatically earns a couple points for just being the first beer in my mouth. Um, but I like it. I've, I've taken quite a few sips, like I said, and it's, it's, it's very balanced. It's, it's tart, but it's not melt your teeth off tart. You definitely get a little bit of the hoppiness. It's super fruity. Um, it reminds me of a margarita in a lot of ways. Uh, I really like this beer, though. What, what do you think? Have you consumed some yet? I don't, yeah, I don't want to be sacrilegious, but there's a couple of places, certainly in town, I guess I won't name drop to play favorites, but you can get like a flight of mimosas. And instead of doing the traditional champagne and orange juice, they'll also add like passion fruit juice or pear juice or guava juice. And the, the sort of effervescence in this beer in particular is very reminiscent of champagne to me. It's super light. It's it's relatively dry when it finishes, um, but it does taste like there's just little maybe like an ounce of juice poured over the top of it, and it makes for a very flavorful, but not yeah like not your what you're saying like not um, certainly puckery. It's it's not that at all. It's 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 tart and it's balanced and it's dry and sweet all at the same time. So I'm I'm very into it on my my first impression at least. Yeah, and it definitely leaves me wanting to take another sip. It's got that nice mouthwatery vibe to it. It's really nice because I don't traditionally like sour beers a lot where like I don't know if I'd have more than one, but I definitely think I could go for another one of these. It's just, it's so light. I love the lightness of it. Sometimes you, you when you, I believe Epic Brewing uh, comes to mind, they've made a few different iterations of their, their tart IPA. Yeah. And those always, there's not much of a baseline to go with stylistically. Like I don't have a wide pool of reference for tropical, like hazy sour beers or yeah. sour IPAs. Uh, but the few that I've had at Epic included were very heavy. Yes, and they set very heavy in your mouth and in your stomach, and they were super filling. But this beer is really light, and I love that. Part of it is probably the 4.2 percent ABV. There's not, it's not super boozy it really strikes me as just like a nice almost like a tropical cocktail or like some sort of of margarita like i said the sourness has almost a like a sour mix margarita mix type vibe to it like if you've ever made your own margarita mix at home with like fresh lemons and limes and like triple triple sec or simple syrup or whatever you want to do it it has that vibe to it and i kind of like that this would be really good for a warm spring day or a, a cold rainy or not rainy but cold december day that's i mean that's one of the things that we talked about that really kind of struck me is that this does seem like a beer that at least on paper is definitely more for you know late spring early summer kind of months but i can't remember if it was fowler kevin saying this but it's been doing well they said in pretty much every market year long and um i was almost concerned when i before i tasted like maybe this would be too light and not necessarily what i'm in the mood for like you're saying on a cold december day but it is hitting a spot that I didn't realize wasn't being hit uh, yeah. lately. And I think it, like what you're saying about sour IPAs, those are both 
stereotypically very aggressive sort of flavors. You got the, the sourness from whatever iteration of beer they're doing with like the bitterness of the IPA. And it's just like, it's too much most of the time for me as well. I'm not about it. Yeah. This really scratches that itch because I know you and I both have the same affinity for sour gummy candy. Love it. And this is really hitting me in like a sour gummy worm kind of vibe. Yeah, it's funny. I'm I into that. Ate a bunch of gummy worms the other day. It's it's not still funny. though. It's not it's not surprising at all. Yeah, you but you do get kind of sick of those after a while. Like I made the mistake a few weeks back of buying like a five pound bag of gummy worms mm. just because I saw it, and when I did, I was like, oh, I'm gonna eat all of them. And then after like two minutes of that sort of mentality, you're like, I'm done with gummy worms. Yeah. And I actually don't think that I'd feel that same fatigue drinking this beer, which is really nice and potentially problematic. Yeah, but that's I like okay. it. I'm I, not concerned with that at the moment. Right? Yeah, we have 2020 to drink away. Let's keep enjoying tropical hazy sour. Uh, actually, let's. I'm gonna flip that around. Is there anything you're not enjoying about it? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I also, I it does it make coming. it. It's yeah, because you have to. And and what you were saying earlier, it does make it trickier. Like you appreciate the brewery a bit more now. Like I've gotten to know them a bit more. I got to know the brewery more. I certainly feel more attached to these beers than I do beers that you know maybe we just kind of pulled out of a out of a walk-in door and like, well, this will, let's try this out. Uh, so I'm, mm-hmm. I'm hoping that I can remain objective, but acknowledging that there's a chance that I'm slightly biased now, but what do you think? Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with being biased when you get to know the people that are making the things you enjoy. I think that that's, um, if anything, it's, I mean, it, it is biasing you, but it's also getting you more in touch with the products you consume. And I think that in itself is, always a good thing. And when you have a chance, I think everyone should try and do that. So I don't think it's a negative to be a little bit biased by this at all. I mean, uh, I liked those guys just from the interview. I liked this place before. So, um, the negatives that I'm finding though, for me really are simply just stylistic. I am never going to be the guy that buys a six pack of this beer. Yeah. A lot of people would. And, this is something I would – this would have like a two-beer maximum for me. Uh, I feel like it would just get into that heartburn territory. Like if you ate this with anything spicy or like – for me, it, it would just murder my insides. So I see that being a negative. It's just – but that's just stylistic. I mean that's going to be that style for anything for me. So, I mean, objectively, this is one of – I would say it's the best hazy – sour ale I've ever – it's not an IPA though, right? So No, it's, yeah, no. It's a hazy sour ale. So it's essentially just a slightly different kettle sour, like they were saying. It's a different beer base, but it's made with the same souring technique. Yeah. Um, they Well, they talked about it a little bit, and I, I probably should have followed up. So my understanding now might be a little bit wrong. But from what I understood, the, the haziness wasn't necessarily a product of – like what you might assume – like when you look at the can, hazy is sort of the word that jumps out to you as, as well mm-hmm. as tropical. But um, it sounded like they just the natural process that they were using, like the kettling process and the fruits they put in this made the beer hazy. Mm-hmm. And and the discussion was like, well, should should we take out the haze? Um, and somebody was like, well, why? Like it tastes good. Haze yeah. is kind of a popular word in beer and it's going to hold up. So why bother? Mm hmm. Um, so yeah, like it's definitely, it's nowhere near an IPA in, in, in obviously the way it tastes or smells or anything or the way it was produced. I just think hazy is more of sort of a, almost like a marketing buzzword that they happen to be able to use to market this beer. Yeah, and it's probably exactly. part of the reason it's doing so well. Um, yeah, it was just a happy accident. Yeah. But what you're saying, I think I'm sort of in the same boat. This is something that if you're not all about that kind of, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's pretty acidic. Like I'm, I'm down to maybe my last, uh, I don't know three or four ounces out of a 12 ounce can. And I'm sort of starting to feel that in my, you know, sort of lower throat, upper stomach kind of region. And that is something, if you're sensitive to that, like I think we both kind of are, this will get old, um, you know, after probably one or two. So that's probably worth knowing going in, but it is a very personal stylistic choice. Like you're saying, excuse me. Yeah. I just finished it and a thought popped into my head that this would be really good with something salty though like popcorn totally i would definitely sit down and eat popcorn and drink this with a movie um so we can both agree this beer has probably a two beer maximum for mm-hmm. us mm-hmm. um but in those two beers how do you rate this out of 10 yes i'm going to end do you want up- me to go first no, I feel like I always let you go first. I want to go first this time. All Damn right. it. You're holding the door open for me. That is a chivalrous move that I will happily accept. I am going to give it, because I also just finished mine, um, which is, can we say that's unusual? 
that doesn't usually happen by the time that we rate the beer. Like we're usually still sipping. So I think that needs to be factored in as well. We both finished this beer in a pretty, pretty short amount of time. Yeah. We uh, kind of both just chugged this beer <laughs> a little bit. Um, yeah, man. I, I, but it, is that cause it was awesome or is it cause we both just really needed a beer? Yeah. Today? It's, it's hard to say, man. That's, that's kind of the handicap of 2020 beers we've done on the show is like, are we, are we delicious or are they troubled? Or am I just happy because I'm putting <laughs> alcohol in my body? Yeah. Um, look, man, I'm gonna end, I'm gonna land on a on a solid eight. I think it's really good. Um, yeah, like a big factor in me really loving a beer is sort of its drinkability and, and re-drinkability, like going back for another. I think they said that in the interview too. Like they they do want to make beers that kind of make you want to drink another. Um, and all of the flavors are on point here. It's just sort of the yeah, that sort of acidity that I know just from my own palate and innards that it's just not gonna go well for me if I drink too much more. So I'm going to say eight out of 10. What about you? That's fair. I'm, I'm pretty much in the same ballpark. I'm landing on a solid. Hmm. This is tough. It's, it's right in that like seven, eight, seven, nine, eight, one, eight, two. It's, it's right in there. It's, it's back and forth, man. And it's funny because by my own rules, a beer has to be an over eight for me to travel for it. Yes. And I wouldn't maybe necessarily travel specifically for it, but I. But you did. did. <laughs> but well, I did. yeah, I mean, you didn't travel for this beer necessarily, but not specifically. But I traveled to the brewery, so that you know, I, I took a, a different way completely just to go here. So I feel like that by default ranks a little bit higher. So I mean, beer's it, an eight, this beer is an eight one for okay, me. Okay, great. I was gonna say it ranks the brewery higher. I was also gonna try to. I feel like I said this recently, but like if I can bring back squares and rectangles, like. You know, not every beer you travel for is an eight, but every eight is a beer you travel for, you know, uh, yep. which just was fun to say. And I hope it made sense because I know I messed that up one time with the square and rectangle thing. I, I switched it, which is a really mm-hmm. good way to look stupid because you're trying to sound smart. Yeah, I do that all the time. But I think I got it right that time. So sure. 8.1 for you. Eight for me. Tropical Hazy Sour Ale from Anderson Valley. Do you have anything else on this beer or do you want to get into some movie talk, man? Uh, I'm good on the beer. It was a pleasurable drinking experience because now I have to find another beer to drink while we talk about this movie before we review our second beer. Speaking of movies, we went back and forth a little bit this week. We ended up on the new film by Lawrence Michael Levine called Black Bear starring Aubrey Plaza. This was Johnny's sort of, I think, the final suggestion. I was like, oh, yeah, for sure. Like, I've heard about Black Bear. I would like to watch it. I didn't know much going in, which was wonderful because I feel like lately, especially towards the end of the year, you sort of hear more and more about movies. Like, I knew a bunch about Mank. So when we go into that, like I won't go in blind, but Black mm-hmm. Bear, I knew nothing about, which is all to say, if you're in that same boat, we're not going to spoil it without giving you a heads up. We're going to talk about some initial thoughts. Uh, but first and foremost, we are going to play you a trailer. So here it is. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back to talk about Black Bear. You're Allison? Yeah. You're Gabe? Hi, I'm Allison. Oh, I know. I'm Blair. You're really pretty. You are, too. You used to be an actress, and now you're a director. Why'd you give it up? I didn't. So do you guys have a plan for this place? I don't really know what we're doing. We were living in Brooklyn, and it was getting so expensive. And we weren't really working, so... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I figured if um, I never learned how to cook, then I would never become a housewife. You're really hard to read. Yeah, you know what? I get that all the time. Do you find it weird acting in your own films? I actually find it kind of humiliating. Roll sound. Mark. Okay, whenever you're ready. Action. You don't think she knows what I'm up to? She's oversimplifying a lot. It's just so rare to pick a real artist's brain. How can you make something if you don't have anything to say? I have something to say. I just think the movie is the only way to say it. It's like she can't stand the fact that I have a single thought about this world. No, it's that I can't stand the thoughts about the world that you have. This has been so fun. That was a trailer for Black Bear. Description as Max found on the internet. At a remote lake house in the Adirondack Mountains of upstate New York, a couple entertains an out-of-town guest looking for inspiration in her filmmaking. The group quickly falls into a calculated game of desire, manipulation, and jealousy, unaware of how dangerously intertwined their lives will soon become. Right. Again, this is directed by Lawrence Michael Levine. His last film was called Wild Canaries, came out in 2014. Johnny, have you seen Wild Canaries? 
No, you? Okay, nope, me neither. This film, though, Black Bear, not The Diner, stars Arby Plaza as Allison, Christopher Abbott, who we talked about, um, I think it must have been last week, in Possessor. In this movie, yeah. he plays Gabe. And also, Sarah, let's say, what do you think? Gadon? Sarah Gadon. Gadon. She's Gadon? French-Canadian. Sarah Gadon. Perfect. She plays Blair. This movie was originally released into the realm of Sundance back in uh, February of 2020. It was released to video on demand December 4th, so just a little over, well, actually a little under two weeks. It runs an hour and 44 minutes long. I agreed to this movie under the guise that it might be a sort of horror, thriller type movie. Uh, I specifically know that because I mentioned to Johnny, we were talking about covering um, She Dies Tomorrow, which is an Amy Siemens film that came out a couple months ago. And Johnny said, and I almost quote, there's a few other horror movies come out recently that I'd rather cover. This was one of those things. Johnny, I want to know if this was up to your horror expectations um, or if it was up to your expectations in general. And, and what did you think of Black Bear just off the, off, off the, off the gun, out the gate, top of the morning to you? <laughs> Whatever <laughs> well, the right phrase is. Um, my my horror film expectations were not involved with this at all because I sent you three movies that I want to watch, two of which I still want to watch and I'm going to watch. Uh, those two, the first two I sent, were purely horror. One's a horror like survival and the other one's like a psychological, supernatural horror movie. Uh, this is not, and I knew it was not. Okay. So caveat there i suggested the two horror movies because she dies tomorrow looks fucking awful oh disagree um, but okay fair enough. we can talk about that if we haven't uh, covered it <laughs> yeah and uh this one was just on my radar because aubrey plaza uh, is adjacent to my universe that i pay attention to so i've been seeing a lot of promo stuff from her and like uh you know interviews popping up and stuff like that so uh i was not expecting a horror movie and uh, definitely expecting more of a drama and that expectation was completely fulfilled this movie was very very interesting uh it was i don't think it's spoilery to say that this movie's kind of two parts i think that's fair uh and they were vastly different while eerily similar uh, i really enjoyed the first act it was absolutely compelling and anxiety inducing yeah. and cr cringy <laughs> and it felt a little like too real and uh just really well acted. Uh, the second act was interesting and different and also really well acted. Uh, this movie does not have a linear plot, let's say, and it doesn't have like an, a start and a finish, let's say. So this is one of those movies where it's going to let you fill in a lot of the gaps and it has a lot of room for interpretation. Both the director and Aubrey Plaza have very strong opinions about this and what it's about. Those opinions are not the same, and they haven't really made them public. Uh, they've both said that this movie is entirely up for interpretation. Well, I'm, from I'm sorry. How did you – they haven't made the opinion that they disagree on public or or those particular – because did you just hop on a call with these two? If it's not public, how, how do you <laughs> no, know this? No, I just – I read some, some interviews that like – you know, they essentially like both have ideas about what this film is about, and those ideas aren't even the same. Oh, okay. That's all you know. Yeah, I exactly. See. And that, yeah, they didn't really want to get into it, what they think it's about, to not, like, bias people. Sure. They basically were like, let's just let people decide for themselves. So if that doesn't sum this movie up, where it's kind of like you just have to, yeah. you know, fill in some gaps. And I have multiple theories, and none of them are probably right, or maybe all of them are right. Um, but it was a really unique cinematic experience. The first half was really gorgeous and the, the two halves were shot in completely different ways, even with different filming techniques, which I thought was really interesting. And visually, they were contrasting. And uh, I really loved some of the, the big, wide shots in the first, uh, first act of this movie. Uh, the acting was super, super compelling. I did not know Aubrey Plaza had this level of acting in her, which I was, I was really impressed by her. Um, apart from, was it Ingrid Goes West? Oh, yeah. Like, she hasn't been in a lot of serious dramas, to my knowledge. So I, I enjoyed her acting in this. I really enjoyed Christopher Abbott and uh, also enjoyed Sarah Gadon. I had not seen her in anything other than Letterkenny. So it was really cool to see a familiar face in a, a way more serious acting type situation. So overall, um, as confused as I was and very intrigued by this movie and maybe not fully satisfied in some ways i did enjoy viewing it uh it was 
viscerally moving at times. And there was a couple scenes that were straight up just hard to watch from uh, mm. just just intensity. Uh, but yeah, overall, I think it was it was a good movie, and I I would love to hear your takes. And I'm really looking forward to talking to you more about it, particularly in the danger zone. I think this is one that like, and I want to say too, huge caveat. The blinder you go into this movie, the better. That's what I would say. I was almost so. going to say that that even sort of talking about the structure of it might have been giving away too much. Granted, that's only because I feel the same way you do, because I got to go in blind, and I, th- I think you mostly did too. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I guess let's say if, as a sort of, sort of prerequisite here, if you are a big fan of Aubrey Plaza or sort of – if you're a fan of the idea of a movie that thematically feels very what the fuck – and you like that experience, I'd say pause mm-hmm. this podcast now, watch the movie and come back. Because like you're saying, Johnny, the blinder you go in, I think to some extent, the better. Um, So with that out of the way, yeah, like we're not spoiling it yet, but I, I do think, I think starting from the ground up, like Aubrey Plaza is sort of the foundation emotionally and, and to some extent narratively of this film. And she does pull out some stops that I didn't know she had. Like particularly in the second half, like she, she gets to do some heavy lifting that sort of, smashes the sort of uh april uh ludgate yeah yeah uh i was gonna say janet snake hole but (laughs) you can never destroy janet snake hole (laughs) ever um but yeah like she she gets to flex some certainly dramatic muscles and the 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 character she gets to play throughout this movie has a very let's say wide uh emotional bandwidth there's a lot going on she gets to thread that needle in in many different ways throughout the film um I also think that, yeah, structurally speaking, this did catch me off guard. Like there's something about that first half that you're talking about that is so kind of anxiety ridden, like to the point where I was almost forgetting to to think about anything else except a lot of that sort of tension, um, per- particularly where it starts at the dinner table. But it's clear that um, Christopher Abbott's character and, and Sarah Gadon's character like don't have a great relationship, uh, to put it lightly. And like, it's not that. Uh, Aubrey Plaza came into the picture and it got worse or it did get worse, but like it was clearly there. Um, I also want to say before we get too far, I want to make sure that we've sort of set this up properly. Um, I think you read, I think what you read was, was pretty good. I I probably could have done a better job laying that out, but um, Aubrey Plaza plays a writer who's kind of getting away to, to work on her next movie. Right. Um, And she's, and I think this gets into some stuff we'll talk about later as far as like the idea of an auteur filmmaker, like the lengths that people will go to to make art um, and what they will put themselves or others through. That's a big thing that starts happening in this movie and starts coming up. Um, but I love that first shot, man. There's some great cinema cinematography down here. I want to look up the name of the DP. I don't have it in front of me, but the first shot of this movie is basically Aubrey Plaza in this bright red one piece swimsuit sitting at the edge of like a, a dock over a lake, but there's fog all around it. It feels very dreamy. Um, to me, almost very purgatory. And when the idea of writer's block came in, that almost kind of stepped in as like a, a neutral ground where she was trying to think of ideas. Um, and I think we'll, I mean, we'll get into cinematography later too, but visually, and, and maybe I should talk about the soundtrack. Like it does a great job. This movie does of, of establishing this environment of tension and anxiety. It's so, it's so, um, I don't know, man. Like I've really felt it. Like I was cringing also. I'm curious to know later what scenes got you, but like, I remember clenching my fist being like, Oh no, like, ugh, I hate it. And, and Mm -hmm. then things start to, to, you know, structurally sort of change. But, um, all of this is a long way of saying I enjoyed this movie. I have tried really hard not to do any reading about it, even post viewing. So I, I'm looking forward to hashing out our our thoughts on this because it's certainly open for interpretation. Um, but I did enjoy it. I'm, I'm a big proponent of new ideas in sort of mainstream accessible movies. And and if nothing else, this is certainly a new way of telling a story. Yeah. Big time. Let's see. Um, any other performances? I know Aubrey Plaza is sort of, like I said, it's sort of the main thing, but Christopher Abbott, he grabbed me in possessor and, and he managed to hold me in this movie. He, he does a really good job. I thought, um, is there anybody else cast wise? If you want a second to pull it up. Um, because I mean, it, it mostly happens in sort of the second half of the movie. It's maybe not spoiling too much to say that there's a film crew involved um, mm-hmm. and some meta elements. And and before we talk about cast, I did want to ask you, because last week or the week before, um, one of your biggest criticisms of the sort of documentary 
uh, Dick Johnson is dead is that the sort of meta elements within the movie were too confusing as reductive. I think you said just, it was a, it was not the right choice for telling that story. And I'm wondering, and I think you'd agree that this movie does have some very strong meta elements. Did that work for you in this? Uh, I think it did. I liked it the way that they brought in some of the more meta and broad stroke type uh, ideas that they painted with. Uh, because I think if you're going to make a piece of art as abstract as this, you need to have at the very least big ideas as a through note to kind of wrap the chaos around to give it like a direction, but not a direction like a road, a direction like, you know, a really big, wide, like a tunnel direction. So Yeah, okay. It's like a yes. wide open plane. Exactly. So I think it gave the 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 plot some things to grab onto. Very infamously, Kubrick put um Shelley Duvall through quite a bit in the filming of The Shining. Are you aware of any mm-hmm. of this? Yes. Okay. That's that's sort of my go to when I think of a filmmaker sort of a I not even in quotes abusing an actor or actress to get a performance before. We, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about this more later, obviously, but as a, as an approach to making stuff art in particular, do you have feelings about that? Like, I, I, I don't know that I do, but I started trying to figure that out as I watched this movie. Where, where do you land on that sort of thing? Uh, I had never really thought about it to any length uh, before this movie, just because I hadn't really read up on it. Not that I, you know, didn't, I didn't give it much mental real estate, uh-huh. put it that way. Yeah. So uh, it's something I'd like to learn a bit more about, I think. And it, you know, it might affect the way I look at some of Kubrick's movies. And, you know, also it's it's one of those things where you have to ask yourself, like, how far is it okay to go to motivate someone to get them to be the best anything, you know? If you're a sports coach or right, right. a director or a boss, like it's a really interesting uh, ethical, philosophical type question of like, you know, where is the the line between like healthy motivation and abuse? Yeah. And like uh, a lot of people that played sports, you know, always remember the coaches that pushed them harder than they thought they could be pushed. And it push them through to the next level. Like they didn't even know their own potential. Um, and sometimes that's through like negative reinforcement. And um, in some cases, like in Kubrick's, you know, straight up like mental abuse. Yeah. So it's a weird, weird thing to contemplate. And it's obviously something everyone kind of has to make their own mind up. And it's, it's kind of a unique position to be in, uh, that setting with that much power, like not many people yeah. will feel that to like to that degree where like you can just completely ruin someone mentally or just swear at them and freak out. Like it's a really interesting place to be. Like I've seen management styles like that where it's yelling and shouting and cussing and <sighs> yeah, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to, to motivate and bring out the best in people. And I think it's, Something that would be really worth looking into more if there's any like good articles out there about like, I don't know if there's a word for that, you know, gaslighting is one for sure. But like the specificity of like a director, you know, abusing or getting under the skin or, you know, whatever you would call it using very unorthodox means of motivation to get the best acting performance. I would like to read that article. I don't. Yeah. Now I'm thinking about it. Yeah. I don't know about articles. There's, there's a book that I have by Sidney Lumet, who's a director, um, maybe most famous for 12 angry men or a uh, long day's journey into night. He also did uh, the original murder on the Orient express. Uh, and the mo- the book is called making movies and I'm going to butcher the details here, but there was a time in the book where he was talking about making a particular film and he was looking for a performance, a certain, and this is like the language, this is the language that you hear when it comes to sort of directors kind of justifying pretty shitty things to people uh, that they're working with. He's, he was looking for something like this, what this X factor that he needed out of this performance from this uh, young lady. And he called cut cause she wasn't giving it. And he walked out there and like had a conversation with her and like legit slapped her in the face and then said Damn. action. 
And then he got the performance. He also said in, in sort of a, a footnote, like, I would obviously never do that again. It was horrible and traumatic. And I, I didn't know that at the time because I, this is what I had learned. And I thought that's how you could get a performance. And he felt very much that it was like, it's not worth it kind of thing. Um, but it does like, you do have to look back because there's been pretty notorious performances in film over, over the years, especially in like the fifties and sixties, like people really abusing their power to justify or, or rather, um, trying to get their finished product and, and using that to justify pretty horrible things that they've done to people uh, in their films. And this mm. touches on that quite a bit. Um, yeah. and in, in the concept of, or the concept in the context of sort of the history of this happening in films, when that sort of thing does start to happen, uh, in black bear, um, I, it sort of brought up some feelings that I didn't even know that I consciously had, but I, I had very, very visceral reactions to kind of what was happening, um, as it happened. <laughs> and the vagueness of my sentence that I'm trying to get out is I think an indicator for me that I'm about ready to start spoiling this. If, if you got nothing else. Oh yeah, no, I, I am definitely as well. Okay, then once again, spoiler alert for Black Bear. You can rent it. Uh, it's available on VOD. We need to rent it before we move into spoilers. So, Johnny, I'll throw it to you first. Out of 10, what you got? Out of 10, for me, Black Bear feels like a 7.6. Yeah, okay, 7.6. I, I, I don't know what to rate it yet. I, right? I've, I've never been in this situation. I, I think that by the time we get to this conversation, or this point in the conversation, most of the time, I've sort of solidified my rating, but I'm, I'm still really on the fence. I don't know how I f feel all together. Like I know that there's some great stuff I loved about this, but conceptually and thematically and, and, and what this movie's trying to say, I don't know that, um, I even fully get it. I definitely don't think I agree with a lot of it, but that's not mm -hmm. a reason to hate a movie in my book. Um, so I'm going to call for an audible here and say that we go into danger territory and then at the end of that, you remind me to come back and rate it because I don't want to give an unfair rating and I want to make sure that I have all my thoughts flushed out and maybe that'll help me come to a conclusive decision. Will you make my rating sound completely uh, premature at this point? No, no, you're, 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 if you're there, this is a weird thing. We've never been to this point. I've never had not had it ready. So you're, you're business as usual. I'm the weird one now. All right. I mean, we're going to have to establish a safe word, but I mean, I'm game <laughs> if you are. Okay. Then uh, how's about we uh, play that fun sound that you love? Do it. Danger zone. Danger zone. Danger zone. Danger zone. Danger zone. Danger zone. Okay, we are in the danger zone. We're spoiling Black Bear. Uh, where to start, man? Should we should we clarify for people that haven't seen it kind of the, the two-part structure, or should we just go nope. for it? Okay. The danger zone is like we've all just seen it. Yeah. So you, me and Max, yeah. we're just you and me, we're just gonna talk now, buddy. Just I guess you and me. I guess the point to pick up from is what I was dancing around. Like in the second act second half um basically instead you know what's happening it's gonna be too hard to explain so you're right we're not gonna do it um the 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 performance that christopher abbott's character gabe as the director is trying to get out of allison mm -hmm. um is a very specific one and to do it he's trying to like convince her that you know he's having sex with blair yeah and i just watched it why are you telling me this? i don't know i can't help it i feel like i gotta set the stage i don't know maybe it'll help me form my question okay um and it, you know, the thing where it culminates with her having a full emotional breakdown and him yeah, holding, that was hard to watch. like holding sort of the, the action on, on the set and waiting for the right moment as this woman is literally crumbling in front of his wife, by the way. Um, yeah. I forgot about that. That, yeah, that was tough. That was one of them. And I'm, it sounds like it was the same for you. That was a very like, oh man, like this is, this is the point where I think most of us objectively be like, this is not worth whatever weird indie film you're making. I don't care if yeah. it's, if it's Citizen Kane or fucking 2001 like you're you're demolishing a human person exactly and i don't know man it just yeah it felt so icky way icky yeah like dude you're fucking gaslighting your wife to make you think you're having an affair with her co-star like just so you put on a better performance and you're like also that's the, like the scene where she was like we've done it like five times and you said that one was good like and he was just fucking with her like just purposely fucking with her and making her do oh, shit over so, and over. So that last one was actually, so she did it twice and he asked his, his DP, was that a good, was that a good take? And, um, she, I can't remember who was even playing the, the cinematographer, but said, no, it, it was soft. So like it was out of focus. No, yeah, not that scene. I meant the, like the scene where she first brought that up when they were on the, the dock, the dock. Sure. Yeah. Yes. hundred percent. Yeah. So 
And uh, what did you think about the two parts? Because I'm in my head, this whole movie is all in Aubrey Plaza's head, and she's either sitting on the dock or she's in that room writing. And these are two basically like make believe like drafts of screenplays in her head. That's, I mean, that's kind of where I started to, not started, but like by the time the second half started, I was like, okay, like maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe this is what she's doing. Cause, cause she leaves the dock and goes to start writing. And mm-hmm. then that's when we get that first sort of uh, title shot where it's, you know, black bear, uh, I think on the road or whatever. Mm-hmm. So that makes sense, but I don't think that's what it is. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm not totally sure why I do think, and I, maybe you keyed into this as well. The very first shot of the movie, um, I don't know, I haven't gone back, but it's the same as the last shot of the movie where she's on the dock, it's foggy, she's in a red swimsuit, and there's a single tear rolling down her right cheek. And that's confusing because that's what happens after he yells at her to try to get the take. So mm-hmm. that's where the movie gets like super, super meta. It's like, is all of this just a commentary on 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 auteur filmmaking or or abuse of people in movies? I don't know. Um this definitely seems like one that if I rewatched it, I would pick up more things because you're yeah. just aware of it, you know? Right. I, I've i thought that it was just multiple scenarios in her head because she recast the whole thing with the same people in her head. But she recast you know herself too. I guess she's yeah. in her movies. That's fair. She's trying to write her movie or she's in her movie, but it's like it felt very intentional to use the same people. Like yeah, it, it almost emphasized make believe or you know f- fiction. So so at bare minimum, I think if this is this, I'm gonna try to dial this down to like the most simple, literal, which is in big quotes here. But like she shows up to this place, I say definitely owned by Gabe and Blair. She arrives, she sees them maybe have an argument that triggers her creativity. She writes an entire storyline about them arguing, the affair, the baby, the whole thing. Ends with uh, them running to the hospital, dying uh, or driving to the hospital, dying from almost killing a bear. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then she finishes that story. Alternate story is making a movie with him as the director and the whole love triangle thing that she observed in the first half. Mm-hmm. I just don't get the. I just don't get it. I guess like I don't know. It was. It felt very unresolved to me. If that is sort of what happened. If it is just about well, her picking out stories, then cool. But I, I don't get the point. You know, so one one thing that I thought too was, um, it could be versions like the first part could have come chronologically second, and the second act was like her, like because we're watching a movie about a movie being made, right? Yes, yes, yes. So the so the second act in I thought maybe could have been her, like writing a screenplay. And about her experience, because all of it added up. Like hmm. she was difficult, she was hard to direct. She doesn't get cast anymore. Like um, maybe that movie pushed her out of acting, mm-hmm. and so she wanted to make a movie about that experience. Maybe this so. Is, maybe the, oof, the yeah. second screenplay is more meta, and that was actually her her experience. And then the first part was the screenplay she wrote about it. I mean, that's super possible, man. Yeah. I, I, I think that coming back to what you were saying or, or repeating that they had said, like there is this sort of obviously intentional ambiguity about what this movie's about. It doesn't seem like Lawrence Michael Levine wants to say, or Aubrey Plaza wants to say, nor does it seem like either of them have really talked to each other about it. Um, mm-hmm. And they're just like, look, here's this thing that we're putting out into the world, which is kind of what Allison says, Aubrey Plaza's character, like, when when Blair asks her, like what's what do you think it's about? And she's like, I don't like to say what my movies are about. I like people to figure it out themselves. And it's like, well, no, I don't really think about it. It's there's so many meta elements in this movie that um, I think make it very difficult to logically digest. But at the same time, like an hour and forty four minutes long, I never found myself bored while watching this, which I think is a God, huge, no. a huge, uh, you know, a high five or thumbs up. Like, because you could feasibly, I should have maybe even predictably, I should have not enjoyed this and maybe enjoy is not the right word. Cause there is so much of that anxiety derived or der- der- deriving sort of stuff, particularly no, in the whole thing, if you're a person that's paranoid about weed, by the way, the whole second half is like, fuck, <laughs> like what's the line, uh, Nora? I don't know, man. Right, man. Uh, ah, I don't, I'm not a big, ev- 
Ugh, I'm not a big and weed every- doer, but like that <laughs> stuff like this is like, this is why I don't do weed. This is how I would be. Like I would be all these people spilling coffee, pouring it on other people, like losing the page. I would not do well in this scenario yeah. on marijuana. Right? That's stressful enough. Yeah. Yeah. But man, that acting from Aubrey Plaza in the last scene when she broke down was just unreal. You know, I had a hard time with that actually. Really? I don't know why. I, I'm i wondering if it's a case of just sort of um, oversaturation of knowing Aubrey Plaza, which like I've gotten over that with, uh, what's a good example? Uh, Robert Pattinson. I no longer mm. see him from Twilight, but it took, it mm. took a while, you know? Um, and to your point, like I haven't seen Aubrey Plaza in quite as many things, like maybe Ingrid Goes West, which is still kind of a, uh, a larger than life character, like stalker, social media person, whatever. But like, I don't know. And part of it was the meta element. Like I was like, maybe I don't understand the movie. And like some of it didn't feel legit. Like the first time that she broke down, I don't know, man, I had hard, maybe I'm just an unempathetic piece of shit, but I had a hard time with it. I'm not sure why. <laughs> That could Fair be enough. it. <laughs> that's that's very possible. Um, any other theories you want to kick around? Not, man? not really. I just I don't I don't know. I think I need to watch it again. Um, it's it's one of those movies, right? Like it really left me like entertained and confused. I also think from the top, I was thinking Black Mirror, probably because there's an episode of Black Mirror called White Bear. Mm. Um, but there are some sort of common themes of just like punishment which is a big if you haven't seen that episode go watch it um but there are some like yeah like the meta thing that black mirror does a lot of the time is very prevalent in this and i just don't get it i need to watch it again i think and i don't really want to watch it again like it didn't leave me feeling good (laughs) but yeah no but i think i need to, to to try to grasp it okay that's not unreasonable but i think i have to rate it yeah i think you do seven okay with room to grow and maybe room to shrink Seven with an asterisk. <laughs> yeah, we'll put a seven. I'm gonna put an asterisk. Good idea. Good idea. Um, okay. Well, I, I take it that you're good on on Black Bear as well. Yes, I am. I uh, well, should people watch this movie, Max? <sighs> I don't think everybody should. No. Yeah. No. This isn't it's not a good movie to throw on if you're just trying to pass the time. Like if you're if you've listened to this conversation and it's piqued your interest, go watch it tonight. And if you've heard all this and you're like, eh, I don't know, then for sure miss it. It's not gonna win you over. Um, if you're not already interested, I don't think. Exactly. You kind of have to be invested in the characters. And I really liked you, your not description, but like the caveat that you placed on it. Like if you like thinking, what the fuck? Yeah. Like if you want that vibe and just like you love indie movies that are so confusing that you, you have to like spend the next two months of your life figuring it out, or maybe you never figure it out that, okay. Yeah, though, with that caveat in place, if you've gotten to this point in the conversation and you still haven't seen the movie, you're not going to have that feeling. So you yeah. might be out of luck. You should have stopped it when I said, if you like the what the fuck feeling, pause it now. If you didn't do it, you've made a mistake. You've robbed yourself of some weird joy that you get from that kind of feeling. Yeah. But that's oh, on you. I did, I did have one role that I wanted to point out that I liked a lot. Sure, sure. It was uh, this guy named Lou Gonzalez, and he plays Chris. She is He is the wardrobe person on the movie in the second act Uh and it made me realize that i want a gay black man to just help me out with all of my tough stressful situations you're just trying to check mark two token characters in one for your life i want (laughs) both of them wrapped up because i'm but he was just such a treat and he was so sweet and he had such a calming demeanor like i would want him to pick my outfits and also like if i come home just super pissed off him just like grab me on the shoulder and be like everything's fine like he just had this calmingness about him and his empathy was like palpable i just liked his character a lot i liked what he did in that movie twofold i like that character too and fuck these guys for writing that character in i will say <laughs> i feel the same did you end up watching Hol- or what's it called the happiest season happiest season or whatever no oh i did uh and daniel levy plays the same character it's the one flamboyant gay boy that gets to be the nice guy and 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 calm down all the straight people in stressful situations. And I just feel like, you know, we can we can. There's there, he's the only guy that was partially normal. Like you can do better in creatively writing, uh, not straight people. I don't know. I'm I'm over I'm over the oversimplification of sort of like the gay sidekick character. I think it's it's boring and reductive and offensive slightly. 
So, and I want one. You can't say I want one, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. I'm just joking. Come on, yeah, man. they're jokes. This yeah. is a character no, I got piece. You. I got you. This is a character piece. I'm doing a character. I'm just joking. I'm, I'm <laughs> pretending to be someone insensitive. Come on. Sure, sure. That's oh, this has all been this has all been just a, a front. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice to meet the I mean, you now. But to be fair, there's worse stereotypes than being to be written of than like course there are. super calming and nice. Yes. And like it's, it's not the a bad voice thing of, to be and the voice of reason. Yeah, it's not it's just it's just uninventive in an otherwise pretty inventive movie. I guess I haven't seen it enough to feel that it is that, but I believe huh. you. Yeah. Uh the problem is um, as somebody like you and I who are straight and don't really have to deal with those sort of stereotypes day to day, that character is like, oh, what a fun person. I like having them around. And like most of my gay friends have been about particularly about happiest season, like, pfft, like we can do better with Daniel Levy, certainly. Uh yeah. Do you watch Shits Creek? Oh yeah, I love Shits Creek. I've only I don't I've only seen a couple episodes, but like Bro, from, it's so good. Give it five episodes and yeah, tell me you don't fucking love it. That's my understanding as well. Um I just, yeah, I just think there's there's a lack of effort when it comes to uh, writing in gay or or bi or, or anybody that's not straight, basically, in a movie. It's like, we can use this template and, and we'll call it good. Well, I don't know. Uh, I would love your white male opinion and how they wrote him in Schitt's Creek. I'd, I'd love to offer it. That's kind of a trademark of, of white males. I'd love to give you my, even if you don't want it, I'll give it to you. I'm going to go ahead and just tell you. And you know what, Max? I haven't told enough people. Let's sure. start a podcast. Sure. That's great. We've done this, my friend. Um, um yeah, go ahead. I'm curious to know um like more like is is that character on Shits Creek like well received by the gay community? Yes. Okay. That's cool. Cuz I thought I loved his character. Like I I feel like I love him just as a person cuz I yeah. feel like he wasn't doing much acting. Like I've seen interviews with him and he's like the same person. Yeah. There's also something to be said for like Schitt's Creek is a TV show. Like you have episodes and episodes and episodes to develop character, which is, yeah. you know, it's, it's, you get more time to, to, you know, kind of peel those onion layers away. Yeah. And also like half the time he's kind of a cold hearted bastard. Totally. I love it. Yeah. It's I, Yeah. Makes sense. So you should watch more of that show. It's fantastic. I've liked what I've seen. I'll check it out. Do it. Uh, okay. Then. We're going to put it Black Bear to hibernation. It's a 7.6 for Johnny. It's a 7 for me. We're going to jump to a break. And my mouth, again, somehow is parched. I'm craving some Anderson Valley. So when we get back, we're going to drink an IPA from them called Funkin' Nuts. So stick around. Ladies and gentlemen and children and cats and dogs of all ages, if you like delicious food that you can pick up and take home, Maybe some alcohol to go to. Whoopity do, getting crazy. Have a happy hour at your house. Because in these strange times of 2020, you need all the options you can get. Well, my friends, I've got a great option for you. Handlebar Chico, right here in town, is a locally owned business, and they are one of my favorite places to eat and drink. They've got fantastic food. Like I said, alcohol to go, if that's your thing. Check them out. Max, where can they find them? 2070 East 20th Street. Like you said, my friend, right on the south end of town here. If you've never been there, right by Winco, right by Best Buy, you'll find them. It's a lovely spot. Again, Handlebar Chico. Go check them out. Buy some food. Buy some beverages. Support local businesses in this weird year. 2070 East 20th Street, Handlebar Chico. What are we drinking next from Anderson Valley? Yeah, man. Funkin' Nuts. Funkin' it's an IPA. Nuts. You heard them talk about it. We finally get to drink it. It's a 7.5% IBU or 7.5 ABV with 58 IBUs. Uh, let's see what this says on the internet that Max copy and pasted right here. Our Funkin' Nuts IPA pours to a bright golden yellow color with aromas of rich tropical fruit, passion fruit with a hint of citrus. Pale Pilsner and Midnight Wheat Malts give it a solid malt character, while Chinook, Citra, and Amarillo hops impart flavors of ripe tropical fruit, peach, and apricot, leading to a clean, hoppy finish. Well, hot damn, this sounds delicious. I've had this, I bought a six-pack and drank it, like, right when it came out. Oh. And I don't remember at all if I liked it or not. So this is essentially brand new. I just know that I've seen the label. Oh, I see. You meant you bought it when, when it first came out. You didn't buy like a six pack and gave me the extra. Like you haven't had this no, in, no, no. in at least a year. No, like as soon, yeah, as soon as this, when this beer came out like a year and a half ago, roughly. Yeah. It was like, like a summer before last, something like that. Um, yeah, I bought a six pack and I think I took it to the river or took it to a party or something back when you could do either of those things. And 
drank it and I vaguely remember it, but I was drinking other stuff. I have had it. I think I remember like somewhat liking it. I'm really excited to revisit it. Uh, have you tried it yet? I've actually just poured it. And I was going to point out when I, when I was talking to Fal and Kevin from Anderson Valley that, well, they, they said something that, that caught my attention. They said, as I was asking for any parting comments, they said, well, you know, we make beer flavored beer, which I think mere weeks ago you had said, you're like this mm-hmm. beard. I, I want a beer flavored beer. I want beer that tastes like beer. And I think I pushed back cause we were, we were talking about, um, I don't know, some type of sour beer, um, or hazies or maybe, yeah. Or maybe it was hazies, which would tie in very nicely. Cause I mentioned to them that you aren't the biggest fan. You're, you're very burnt out on the new England IPA. So when, when we saw, when I saw that this beer was going to be in front of me, I figured you'd be very stoked on it because it is at least on paper, very much more the traditional West Coast IPA, super hoppy, like you said, 50, uh, 58 IBUs, seven and a half percent, Chinook, Citra, Amarillo, right up the uh, right up the bowling alley of what you want in uh, a West Coast IPA. So hopefully, I have filled enough space that you have now tried it, and I can throw it to you first. Oh yeah, I've already drank like half of it. These beers, they're all their beers are really easy to drink. I don't know if I'm getting them like because I was at the brewery last Saturday, and maybe these are all just like super banging fresh. But like, hot damn, this is really just drinkable, man. Like, wow, unbelievable. Have you did you check the date on these at all? You know, yeah, I looked on the bottom. It looks, oh, it looks, it's Julian in it. It's weird letters and numbers. Okay, and I don't know. I think it was the thirty third day of August in two thousand twenty. <laughs> that doesn't even make sense. Or perhaps, it, uh, maybe it was the thirty third month. It's hard to say. I can't read that date. I don't know what it means. We really ought to learn that. I will say that on the nose, this is a super danky beer. Like it's very, very, very weedy. Like with some like kind of sweetness going on, but but my first thing is like almost sort of an overripe sort of weed vibe. You get any of that? Yeah, I like it. I like it. That's the vibe I want when I pour a beer. It looks it, it looks great, man. It looks like a really straightforward IPA. Like I've got a bit of lacing in my glass. I'm also drinking it out of that IPA glass that I've been digging lately and this is the this is the, yeah this is the beer to drink out of it like mm-hmm. it's got like a little bit of bubbles still coming up from the bottom and just a very thin layer of a head going on but it's it looks really great it looks like a super drinkable approachable ipa i'm not at all mad about that um you get anything like that what are you drinking this out of uh i am drinking it out of an anderson valley shut uh, up are you really uh, yeah you can see the picture on our instagram story um i'm gonna post it as soon as we're done recording sweet uh it is an anderson valley can uh aluminum can shaped glass oh okay I, one of those i i got this glass the first time i went to anderson valley and anytime i drink their beers i have to drink it out of it yeah it makes sense you like it though you like it a lot it sounds like dude this beer is fire this beer is absolutely fire i'm gonna say i love it it is really clean drinking it's giving me a bunch of hops up front but it's it's really mellowed out by just like a subtle juiciness. It's not so juicy that it it gets sweet, but it's like it's just juicy enough to make it not so hoppy. It's like bitter and aggressive. Like the the juice just mellows out and takes all the rough edges off of that and turns it into like something soft and really pleasing to drink. And it finishes really easy too. It doesn't leave you dry or like you know it a lot of ipas you can get that like what the hell did i just put in my mouth um it finishes in a way that it makes me want to keep drinking it and it's the lightest crispest 7.5 percent ipa that i can recall drinking i mean usually anything over seven percent you're starting to feel it like i'm thinking about like IPAs that are in that range that I've drank recently and you know what's up, but like you could have told me this was like a six flat and I'd have been like, yep, this is bomb. I dig it. So you're getting a little bit extra ABV with just as drinkable of a body and mouthfeel as you would with lighter beers. Uh, I'm digging this and I'm also getting a bit of earthiness from the Amarillo hops, which I really like because it, it levels off that juice and it levels off in a way that just takes the edge off the juice also. So there's like a like a descending layer of edges getting taken off. So you got the hops getting mellowed out by the juice, and the juice gets mellowed out by the hops a little bit too, by the Amarillo. It's cool, man. I'm digging the, the flavor profile of this beer. It's very unique. What do you think? I don't like it. <laughs> no? No. Um, 
I mean, I don't think that anything you're saying is necessarily wrong. Aside from maybe the the weight of it, it does feel pretty heavy to me. There's a oh really? Yeah, I I don't know exactly. We people have different palates, obviously. Um, it feels yeah. I don't. It feels really malty and and it's sitting pretty heavy on the back of my tongue. Um, I'm not wild about the flavor profile. It feels sort of musky to me or musty, both. Hmm. Um, like there's a heavy musk in the mustiness. Um, the tropical description they gave is pretty good, but it, it feels overripe to me. There's, there's a pretty good amount of, um, I, yeah, I don't know. It, you're saying there's not a lot of, or not an, an over sweetness to you, but the, there's mostly sweetness for me. There's certainly really? a hot bite up front, but it, it, it sort of gives way to this bigger, um, yeah, like, like a real heavy sort of, um, just, just experience in general, like all parts of it are pretty, pretty taxing to me. Like it's, I'm, I'm struggling to go, to want to go back for another drink. Weirdly enough. What? I know. That's very surprising. Which actually makes me happy because for a long time I was concerned that I would uh, be unable to give sort of a dissenting opinion against you and against, um, certainly people that I've had a great conversation with. So in, in a selfish way, I'm glad that I can still be kind of objective. Like we talked about earlier. It's just, I, yeah, I don't, I don't think this is for me. I don't think it's a bad beer. Definitely not. If you're into West coast IPAs that are a bit heavier, I think that's where you and I are disagreeing the most is that it's a heavy seven and a half percent. It's, it's not drinkable to me. Do you, is it still, have you, assuming you've had more, um, still just as light as it was in your first drink. Yeah. Mine's almost gone. Like I wish I had more. Well, if we were back in the same room as in years past, you, you, you could have had mine. I'm, I'm not, I'm not mad at it. I, I'm getting to the point where I'm trying to determine if I will finish mine. And I don't think that I will. Um, Max, mm -hmm. are we going to have to employ the Nick land for locometer? Let me take another drink. You got anything else you're observing in yours? Maybe talk about the can a little bit. Well, I mean, I wanted to really evaluate what you said. So I took a drink and kind of held it in my mouth and let it swish around a little bit. And I do get some of the sweetness you're talking about, but also when I did that, I really got a good sense of the hops and the brightness of it. So I'm I'm still for sure disagreeing. I feel like it's bright, it's crisp, it's clean, it's easy drinking. Um, I'm not mad at it, man. I'm really, really enjoying it, actually. So I'm trying to find any of the faults you're describing. And um, I mean, some of them are there to a point. It is definitely a, a bit maltier than I would like. That would probably be my number one. Yeah drawback if you, you know, less malty sweetness would be really it'd punch it up but i get it they're trying to go for a little bit of a juiciness type thing here so you have to bring that into consideration i suppose there's there's almost an interplay of of a spiciness going on with that yeah. kind of heavy malt thing and i and, and i don't know man i might chalk that up to the chinook or, or maybe the amarillo but it's just it's i don't know it's a weird it's a weird thing going on with with those characteristics and the, the tropical fruit flavors that I'm getting. I, I just, I don't know. It's a weird marriage to me. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't love it. Yeah. Uh, we're not getting, well, where, where do we say the Nick, if, if, if there's any new listeners, which I hope there, I always hope there are, the, the Nick Land uh, Four Locometer is a, is a, is a marriage of uh, Four Loco and uh, I guess thermometer, speedometer. What do you think? Odometer? Um. The thermometer. You're checking the temperature yeah, okay. of your mouth. So it's shorthand for a scale where if a beer gets so bad, you decide you'd rather drink a Four loco, which has a long history on this show for when we don't watch movies and have to drink them. I don't – what's the number that that, that is uh, an option? That is every man's decision for oneself, sir. I thought we had a scale. A, okay. Well, then no. Then like, no. Then For me, it was – Go ahead. Do you want to know mine? Yeah. Because for me, it was like a four or a three. Somewhere in that range. If it's, I mean, a four and a three are very different, dude. If you're going for a four loco at a four in a craft beer, like, I think you just like four locos. Mm, that's fair. Probably like, a three. Pretty close to middle of the road. <laughs> yeah. So I'd say like, I'll fine. I'll split the difference. I'll say like 3.2. Uh, sure. That's going to be easy to remember. Um, mine's a, t so mine would be at two. If, if it's a beer is, is a two or lower. Wow. So you'll drink a, just an absolute crap craft beer that's like a 2.5 bear in mind yeah that like the scale is one to ten not zero so we can't go below one so so basically if it's not total garbage and and total garbage for me starts around two and and it's like total garbage with a redeeming characteristic might be a 1.5 so yeah like at the very least four loco is gonna get you to where you're going so you forget about the travesty that that previous beer was in your mouth so yeah I, around two five i would still drink probably the craft beer but if we get down to a two 
Um, no, I'd go for loco. And all that to say, this is not that, this is nowhere near that for me. This is much closer to like a middle of the road kind of thing. I, I won't show my tip my hand yet, but it's, I don't love it. I I'm hesitant to say that I like it. Um, but I don't hate it or even dislike it. So I think, I think if anybody's a math person, they m- might be able to predict where I'm going to come out on this, but you know, that's kind of what I'm feeling in the moment. That's fair. Okay. So okay. that was super and ambiguous and I look forward to hearing your rating. Uh, give me yours first. Uh, so for me, um, I'm really enjoying it. The question is, is it, is it a 10? Is it life changing? Is it? Oh, the, I got the caught best. up. I'm sorry. I got caught up because I because I'm not so jazzed on it. I do have to ask you the, the regular question. Like what what do you not like about it? Yeah, exactly. So the questions then are have I had something like this? Yes. Is it uh unique in a way that would launch it right up into the nines, let's say? And to me the answer is no. Okay. Because it is good. Um it is very it's falling into like a market trend. And it's it it really hits that like that new generation of IPAs that we were talking about from some of these breweries, um, so I feel like it's it's good. It's way above average, but it's great. I don't know. I don't know if I can say it's great. So for me, this beer falls somewhere in like it's like high sixes. Okay, like mid mid high sixes. It's like a six eight for me, like a six eight six nine. Super respectable rating, but which are you going to go with? Uh, let's do six point nine because that that ball be horning. Okay, <laughs> six point nine for Johnny. I'm gonna go, you know, and even five, man. It's it's right there. Um, it's one of those beers that if a friend of mine who was like, hey, there's this new beer from brewery, who by the way is run from by really cool people. They made this beer. I'd be like, okay, great, and I drink it, and I'm like, this is this is good. I, it is sort of textbook though. This is fine for me. And I think that's an okay thing to be. So it's a five it's a for textbook me. fine. Textbook fine. 6.9 for you. That's Funkin' Nuts uh, from Anderson Valley. Johnny, I will ask you the classic question since we've switched to our new uh, two beer per brewery format. Which beer did you prefer? Funkin' Nuts or Tropical Hazy Sour Ale? You know, this is going to surprise a lot of the naysayers out there, a lot of my critics. <laughs> You're uh, crazy. But I'm gonna I'm gonna have to go with Funkin' Nuts. Oh, that I'm not even one of your critics, and that surprises me. Why? Um, it's way more my style. That's like true. Big time. I will take a six point nine West Coast IPA versus an eight point one uh tropical hazy sour ten out of seven days of the week. And that's not even a real number, but that's how strongly I feel about it because I want to drink. I, I I would murder a six pack of this in a day, like a Saturday or a Sunday, like a football Sunday. Like wake up, make some scrambled eggs, crack one of these, and like ice cold all day. I would for sure murder a whole six pack of these and then some like white claws and have a great day. Um, I would be able to drink like two of the tropical hazy sour, and then I'd be like, all right, we need to switch to something else, something lighter, maybe some 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 cheap corporate loggers of some sort, uh, but. For me, big time, the the Funkin' Nuts, it's 100%. I think anyone that knows me and like listens to the show would probably be able to anticipate that answer, that it's way more my style and it's way more something that I would gravitate towards and drink multiple of. So hands down, Funkin' Nuts for me, even though I rated it lower. I know my life is weird. I don't understand it either. I'm sorry. You know, I mean, as a person who uh, knows you pretty well, especially in the context of this show, I didn't really see that coming, but... I guess that makes sense. The only thing I really disagree with objectively is a corporate logger, but you know, fair enough. I get it. I take your point. Well, I don't know. I love Rainier, man. Is Rainier corporate? It's owned by Pat's Blue Ribbon. It is? Yep. That makes me feel gross. Why? It just seems it just seems more small town, you know? Yeah, it's because it's a small town in Washington where my mom was born. That's why I love it. Oh, I'm enough. sorry. Olympia. <laughs> yeah, Rainier. Olympia. Oh, okay. Olympia is different. Yeah, but it's also owned by Pabst. But but so is Rainier? Yeah. Oh, that's upsetting. It's very upsetting. There's no small businesses these days. Getting off track. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, fair enough. So again, uh, good, man. Funkin' Nuts, 6.9 for you. Five for me. I would like to get into... Your no, fav- you don't get out of this without answering the same damn question? question. I didn't know that you cared. Okay, ask me. 
which beer did you prefer? Yeah, pretty easily tropical hazy sour ale. I thought it was great. Um, even though like, yeah, I'm probably not going for more than more than one and a half or two, but I just think that the lightness and the flavors that come through because of that lightness are way better. It's just too heavy. This beer is too heavy for me. And I, I'm not getting, and partially because of the, of the hot profile, I'm not getting the flavors that I like anyways. Um, I would hazard a guess that even if this were made with even like just, just mosaic hops, whatever malt bill they went with is, is still probably a bit too heavy for me to enjoy the flavors that uh, would come out of that anyways. So have, have you considered growing stronger? I have, I, you know, you and my mother work out more, be strong. I can't do it. It's not my thing. Is your mom Russian? Work out, be strong. What are you, what are you referencing? It sounded like she, she sounded Russian when you said that, just the way that she said it. Like, that sounds like my mom. Work out. Be strong. No, no, I didn't mean I, mean, I wasn't trying my Russian accent. It could be that I was preparing subconsciously all of our characters for our Christmas special next week, but that wasn't intentional. Work out. Be strong. Work out. Be stronger. Be strong. You are weak. <laughs> be strong. Johnny Summers, what has you hot and or bothered this week? Mother of God. Do you want the album or the, uh, the hot first? Album first, baby. Okay. So usually it's album movie I've been doing lately. Usually. Yeah. One of these days uh, you'll put the album first in the notes, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'm good at this. Uh, so if you are a listener, which, which makes sense since you're listening, uh, you'll know that <laughs> a couple episodes ago I was super hyped on the Sturgill Simpson album that came out called Cut and Grass Volume 1. Well, surprise, last Friday he dropped Cut and Grass Volume 2. Volume 1 was fantastic, and this is basically just 10 more songs from his his back catalog uh, with some songs that I really love uh, off of one of his albums that are all completely redone with a bluegrass band. So completely reimagined, revamped, and bluegrassed up to all hell. And it's, dude, it's such a vibe. I love it so much, and I cannot stop listening to it. I have been rocking both those albums along with um, some other really weird stuff lately. But those two albums, for sure, I've been in a very bluegrass mood. It's got me going back and listening to like the Brothers Comatose and uh, some other bluegrass that I really like. So it's fun. It's a fun like bluegrass is a really cheerful. It's hard to be in a bad mood and listen to bluegrass. Hundred percent. Yeah. Although so, it, it's easy to not like bluegrass. I have found it is. It's just so yeah. like. <laughs> Which is like yeah. a certain mood, but if you're not in the mood for that, it can be sort of, uh, you know, cloying. Yeah, exactly. But I I love his voice and his writing and his, his just vocal stylings. He's just such a unique artist. Um, this coming out actually prompted me to go back and watch his Tiny Desk concert from NPR, which is oh one of yeah. my favorite Tiny Great Desk one. concerts of Great all one. time. Yeah. It just he's such a gifted musician and such an amazing voice and he's like a wizard with like country style guitar like watching him if you've never watched Sturgill Simpson's Tiny Desk concert on NPR you should go watch that like before you do anything else like seriously don't even park your car just okay. watch it while you're driving well it was so good you know i mean put it on maybe don't maybe don't drive and watch it you can listen i'm just saying yeah, you can totally on youtube listen. and yes. you play it through your speakers yeah, it's. I mean, it's music, man. You don't have to watch it. You, you know, I think some of those NPR Tiny Desk made their way to Spotify. So there's a chance you can Google NPR Tiny Desk Concert on Spotify. Not Google, but Spotify it. And then uh, it'll be a playlist. And then you don't waste your video data if that's a thing that that's, you do. I didn't know that. That's really neat. Yeah. Yeah. What a dope thing to have on a playlist. I would right? so listen to like a mix of that. Ugh. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Dude, like uh, Thundercat. His tiny desk was mm -hmm. so dope. Anderson Pax is great. Iron and Wine yeah. has an amazing one. Yeah. They're so there's, good things. there's been so many good ones. So yeah, Cut and Grass Volume 2 and apparently Tiny Desk Concerts. Watch those. All right, let's switch it up. Oh, shit on a shingle. That's right. It's time. It's Christmas. Me and my wifey poo decided to not exchange gifts, but instead buy one big thing that we both want, and that is a Nintendo Switch. And I bought it, and it's coming and it's in the mail. It's going to be here like Thursday. So I'm super excited. If you guys have a Nintendo Switch, tell me what your favorite game is because I'm a huge Mario junkie from days of old, like back to like the Game Boy and NES. So I'm super stoked to keep Nintendo alive in my house. I got the bundle that comes with Super Mario Kart 8. It comes with a three-month online subscription for free. So I'll be playing 
online with Max and Brian McAllister. Shout out. He's nice. got the Switch happening. So we'll all be playing together very soon. If you have a Switch and you want to play games with me, email the podcast, your Switch ID or whatever it is. I don't know. I don't have one yet. Yeah. But if you have one, you know what it is. Get it to me. We'll play games together. It'll be great. I'm so excited. Sweet. Well, listen, man, I want to jump on the sort of uh, uh, things that I've been imbibing upon train. Uh, but mine is neither uh, audio nor video game. It is purely television-based video stuff. And yes. it's it's something that you recommended to me, I want to say, what do you think, two or three weeks ago? Something like that, yeah. Okay. Ted Lasso right. is, a, is an exclusive Apple TV Plus show in which – Jason Sudeikis plays an American fella named Ted. It sounds like he's from Texas based on his accent. Kansas. Um, oh, Kansas. You're right. I should know that. But I'll tell you why I don't in a moment. Um, he is picked by a woman who has gone through a divorce, who has won over or in the divorce, the soccer team, as they call it, football in England, and hires Ted Lasso to be the head coach. He has no experience playing soccer slash football. And she's hoping that this this Pick will drive this team into the ground and ruin her husband's legacy. And what ensues, I've been about five episodes deep, so Johnny, please don't let anything slip that I haven't seen yet, but is Jason Sudeikis, as you told me, sir, weeks ago, being the most lovable, amazing person that I think that you might have even said is adjacent to my own personality <laughs> um, right? on TV that I've maybe almost ever seen ever. There's something so likable about Jason Sudeikis, and he's got this really, in any other role, creepy ass mustache, but he's so damn adorable. Isn't he the best thing you've ever seen? Now, the reason I forgot that he's from Kansas is because I started this last night after watching Black Bear because I didn't want to go to bed on Black Bear. Again, if you've seen it, you get it. Um, so I started around 1130, 1145, maybe let's call it midnight. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to watch like one of these. I, again, not a big weed doer, but I had like a small little edible to help me go to sleep. Uh, didn't, it was apparently not strong at all. Did not get high, did not get tired, nothing. And I ended up staying up until 4 a.m. watching Ted Lasso. <laughs> and I still wasn't tired when I called it, but I was like, I have to go to bed. Like this is enough. But it's such a, a magnetic show, particularly because of Jason Sudeikis. Like you, it's, it, you can't look away and he has that kind of charisma slash tragic sort of dad incompetence kind of thing that like you're like, oh, but also, oh, and then also like, oh, it's like a combination of Michael Scott and like, I don't know, um, President Obama. There's there's this weird like middle ground in which there's exists just, Ted Lasso. Right. He's got this infallibility I that know. is just it's so contagious. You're like. I, I think about that show sometimes and it like makes me more like cheerful and positive. Yeah. Cause you finished the whole thing, right? Oh yeah. I'm about to start it again, dude. So there's only 10 episodes in season one. And I, the fact that I finished and they're, they're about a half an hour each. Um, like, I mean, I, I almost, I don't know that I have the self-control, but I want to try to space it out because there's so many great little nuggets of comedy. And I, I know that slightly drunkenly and pretty tired, ish um i didn't catch enough of it the first time around so i'm yeah. gonna go back as well but i want to just have the wisdom to kind of space it the first time through that's fair. um big shout outs to to hannah waddingham who was in um the british comedy show sex education she plays the woman who is going through the divorce that hires ted kind of as a joke um yeah did you recognize her from anything else uh you know that's that's where i i latched on to but what are you thinking of she was the nun, the shame nun from Game of Thrones. That's her? Shame, shame. Oh, wow. Yep. No, I, uh, I, no, no. Maybe it's the, it's the hair, you know? She's yeah. always in the uh, sort of nun nunnery garb. In that what show, do they call that? There's a word for it. You don't want to go with nunnery garb? I feel really good about no, that. No, it's called a habit. Uh, oh, you're right. Yeah, it's called a habit. Nice. Yep. Um, I also love the character of Nathan. Played yeah. by Nick Nick Muhammad. Oh, isn't Nathan great? He's the team's. Um, I think they call him a Kitman. He's like kit a, man. He's a kit man. He's like a ball boy slash water boy slash like equipment. Just, he's the equipment uh, he's, manager he's, he's, for totally. anyone that knows anything about sports. Okay, great. Which is not me. Um, 
he's just like the most endearing little goofball kid that has been with the team for forever, but like gets picked on, but also has some pretty good ideas. Um, it also has a uh, Juno temple who plays the girlfriend of like one of the kind of douchier sort of, um, football players called Jamie Tart, who's played by Phil do, Dunster. Do, 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 do. Great. Yeah. Great, great cast. Um, it's one of those shows that really kind of, I, I think that on paper shouldn't work, but with, with the entire lineup that they cast, it, it just magically does work. And coach bean. Oh, sure. Coach Dean, coach beard. Is, Coach I, Bean is such fire. He's just like out of nowhere with the funny lines. I love him. Yeah, he's worked with uh, Sudeikis before. He's um he's written and acted with with Jason in in uh, Where the Millers, Horrible Bosses. Um, yeah, they, they, the two of them have like that real sort of like on screen like we've known each other for a while kind of chemistry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it reminds me of someone from like the Sandler camp. Those like all those actors that just vibe, just like they you could tell. I was gonna say it reminds me of uh, me and you. Oh, well, that too. I'm definitely <laughs> Coach sure. Bean in this situation. 100%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, 100%. <laughs> okay. That's all I have for Hot and Bothered. Um, do you want to let people know what's going on next week? Yeah. So next week, something unlike anything we've ever done before is happening. We are actually getting together after some COVID tests. Yep. And in person for once in our lives this year, I'm so excited, completely clean, tested, negative so stoked we're gonna actually sit next to each other we're recording a very merry fresh hop cinna christmas special and we're gonna be reviewing christmas themed beers from prairie artisan ales uh service swam from norway and yingling from philly so they're from philly right uh i actually don't know that you're probably right uh, whatever they're from the east coast they're one of the oldest craft or one of the oldest breweries in america they were yeah established days ago so uh next friday pay attention it's an episode unlike anything we've ever done before it's sprinkled with whiskey and christmas cheer we wouldn't have it any other way i cannot wait to do it so look forward to that worth a couple of shout outs here the yangling beers are from our friend of the show john wallam that's worth noting. He gave us one of the Hershey Younglings, which is super exciting. We're also, it's going to be, so it's going to be a little bit different than our normal episode. It will be in our feeds, but if you're a visual learner, it's also going to be on YouTube. If you are not subscribed to our YouTube channel, it's as you may have guessed at Fresh Hop Cinema or youtube.com slash Fresh Hop Cinema. Um, so it'll be a whole thing. We're reading a Christmas carol and in between acts of the play, we'll be reviewing slash drinking. We're going to be drinking these beers the whole time, but allotting time to review them. So like Johnny said, it'll be a very special, unique sort of sort of episode we're very much excited for it i'm hoping to get a fake fireplace to put behind us no big deal god damn i can't wait okay then as usual the show wouldn't be what it is without the support of bailey minardi who by the time you hear this will have had a birthday so if you uh, are friends with bailey on social media or you have her number text her happy birthday she'd appreciate it uh that's johnny summers that's max minardi we will see you next week for a very merry fresh hop cinna christmas Special event production spectacular. Report to that. We hope you enjoy the little This is Fresh Hop Cinema.